Hey, this is Tyler Jones, and you're listening to The Element Podcast. What's happening on Woods people? Today is a much better day than yesterday. It is. I thought it was supposed to be 99 again today. I don't know. We've just been blessed with some clouds, so yes, I'll we, take it. We have. You know what else we're blessed with? What's that? The presence of a black squirrel. <laughs> we are. He's been hopping all around. <laughs> Dude. He, it's the second appearance he's made on a podcast. I know. I think it's good luck. Man. It is. I think it is. <laughs> today on the podcast, we have Brian Broderick from Day 6 Gear. They do some archery stuff, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But more than anything, it's going to be southern deer culture, and, uh, and uh, Brian is quite the guy to have chatting with you he's a good storyteller <laughs> and he's i bet he would be a fun guy to have in camp if you ask me yeah yeah that would be fun he also uh goes out west and elk hunts quite a bit too so uh, i believe he has been to where we are going this Ooh. fall so kind of excited to get to talk to him a little bit about that Gila unit but talk a little bit here's the deal that. has he sent you map dots yet not yet okay. but I do have multiple phone numbers for Brian Broderick, so <laughs> I good. will pester him until I get those. <laughs> okay, that's good, because I feel like, you know, you drew that tag, and I drew the Iowa tag, and everybody was like, before we drew you, oh, yeah. and then <laughs> you started hitting them up for information, like, oh, yeah, I mean, I'll get that. I'll get back to you. Don't yeah. worry. Don't worry. Yeah, I'll talk to you in October. After oh, the sorry. I was cooking a pig butt, you know, whatever. It's like, no. come on now. Yeah, no, he's, uh, he's, he's cool, man, and I don't think he goes back, so he, he ain't got nothing to... To worry about he yeah. he's uh he's going to a different unit this year but anyways uh looking forward to to just kind of pan talking a lot about um the not deer side of deer hunting mm-hmm. you know like there's a whole lot more to deer hunting than than releasing an arrow oh, yeah. and i feel like and we talk about this a lot on the podcast and sorry if you're bored about bored with this guys but it's fun you know like yeah. it's fun to go and do the the deer camp thing, and, mm-hmm. and I'm kind of excited about getting to do that a little bit more this year. It's yeah, for cool. sure. I'm also excited to give away some binoculars. Are you? I am. Oh, man. We, uh, we're we giving them away. I'm sure you've heard if you're a kind of regular listener. If you're not, uh, unfortunately, you have to knock you guys in the head with this, some of you. <laughs> It's just it's just the way it is, man. I, people are like, oh, I don't know how I miss that all the time. We're like, oh, uh, well, I don't either. But we're giving away... Uh, quite a bit of gear for, uh, and just in thanks that uh, we reached 100,000 downloads. That's so, right. KC, uh, how do they win? So it's super, super duper easy. Like literally, you could win binoculars for spending 45 seconds yep. writing the Element Podcast review on iTunes slash Apple Podcast. So yep. go to the app that you're listening on right now. You don't even have to press pause. You can go and search whilst listening to this podcast. Awesome. Search the Element Podcast, scroll down, give us five stars, tell us something cool or something we need to improve on, and then you have uh, entered into this giveaway where we're going to give away a pair of Vortex 10 42 binoculars, some Onyx uh, premium memberships, some cool swag, and then if we get... A few more to reviews. 300, right? Get to 300. We're pretty, I mean, we're pushing right now. Are we? Yeah, we're pushing. If we get to 300 by the time we get back from the Gila hunt, we're going to give away a real nice trail camera, too. Yep, yep. So a lot of good stuff coming through the pipe there to you. Uh, I appreciate the reviews, too. That um, They really feel heartfelt. I know you guys are just trying to win gear out of us, but <laughs> they really do feel heartfelt. And, and uh, there's been a lot of people that have liked the Backcountry series, yeah. which is cool. So that's actually probably going to wrap up pretty soon uh, if you're listening to this thing in real time. Uh, we're looking at maybe last week, I guess. It was yeah. one, one more week of the, the Backcountry series, unfortunately. Uh, but fortunately, it is also ending about the time people should start going backcountry hunting. So that's right. It's not it's long. It's like we planned that. Uh, it is, isn't it? <laughs> and so uh, that's coming up soon, and the hunting is what we all live for. So get uh, get that podcast knowledge in your head and go out, get your gear, and go hunting, man. But uh, um, we recently have done a little scouting in our uh our home state here um thermal scouting how about that and that's kind of becoming a thing uh and neither one of us has either has the money or has the gumption to tell our wives that we've spent three thousand dollars on a thermal scope (laughs) but we have buddies that have taken that risk and uh, (laughs) that's a good thing so we got to go out uh with our buddy brendan rhodes who was on the podcast uh, a while back has he been on twice 
Uh, he's been yes. on the Elk Podcast, and then we just did a podcast way back in the day. Yeah. And we might do another one about this thermal scouting thing, because it's pretty cool. Dude. It's like a new world, man. Yes. It's, uh, what's that, what Disney movie is that on? A Whole New World. Um, a Whole New World. That's Aladdin. Is it? It's, yeah, we're going to call it Aladdin okay. scouting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it might have been, um, oh, what's the, uh, what's the. The Pocahontas uh, movie? No, I was thinking It's also more. a new world. <laughs> Yeah, it's, that's kind of <laughs> it is, isn't it? Uh, I was thinking, um, ah, the one with Ariel. What's that that's, one called? That's uh, Little Mermaid. Little Mermaid, yeah, because yeah, she's you know seeing the whole new world. It's true, above it's the a surface. different world above the surface. Yeah. Mm. Uh, anyway, under the sea, <laughs> under, under the, the sea. sea. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thermal scouting is freaking awesome. We saw some big bucks on private and public land. Yeah, and we actually kind of used that thermal scouting to. Go hang a couple trail cameras on public when it mm-hmm. was a bazillion degrees outside. Oh, and uh, hopefully you're going to pick up some big bucks before they change to like more of a fall pattern and might be able to get a opening day grande. Dude, I've been thinking about the opening day grande thing really a lot lately. Hey. And yeah, so we so we did. We got we saw the bucks and, and man, the the key to the thermal scouting deal was like, uh, or the I guess one of the biggest advantages is that like. Around here, we don't see deer in the daytime, really. Mm-mm. Like you, I mean, they don't come out and, and get visible in the daytime. So if you and can go we out don't want to be out in the daytime. No, it's, it's hot. It's hot, exactly. So we like grab sweet teas and took off in the night when it's you know eighty five instead of ninety nine, and uh, we got to glass these fields with thermal and find deer really easily. And the thing is, man, when you find deer adjacent to a uh, property you have permission to or whatever, you uh, can pretty close. I mean, you have a pretty good idea of where they're they're bedding because they're just not moving much. Even you know when it's eighty five at night, like a deer doesn't want to move much either. And we were noticing, we spent like twenty or twenty five minutes uh, glassing a, a few deer the other night, a uh, particular group of bucks, and they didn't move hardly at all during mm-hmm. that time. I mean, they be- several of them bedded like twice, I think, mm-hmm. and um, that just kind of to me kind of proves like eh, they're not moving much this time of year so being that it's 10 30 or whatever time at night it was uh i don't think that they've come far you know yeah. so we went in and hung cameras and um i am like really stoked i've got a couple of good ideas uh, including one of the spots we hung the last camera at uh, the other the other day um as far as like i think that would be a great spot to be on opening day i mean mm-hmm. there's a couple of spots we we actually hung some trail cameras on water which we've never done um our good buddy tony peterson if you haven't listened to the podcast we did with him that's uh, a couple months ago i think march april something like that maybe uh maybe even may uh but yeah this spring we did one with him and, and he kind of gave me this um some knowledge about water holes that led me to believe that maybe we could pull it off here and especially in a certain situation that we figured out uh, from thermal scout the other night so all that said it was awesome we're going to put a video out about it pretty soon and kind of show uh, what was going on that night and maybe talk about a few tips and things that we learned along the way uh, but i've got a lot of footage to filter through and put together <laughs> in regards to that so it may may still be a week or two before i get that out uh, we'll let you know when that comes out Otherwise, what else is new, KC? Ah, uh, that's about it, man. I'm ready to just go elk hunting, tell you the truth of the matter. We've been shooting the bow some. I got some arrows in today, so I've got my hunting arrows for this this uh, this season. I've got to put the final components together on those, and those happen to be day six arrows yeah. uh, of who whom we are interviewing today with Brian Broderick. So uh, looking forward to that, going with an even heavier arrow this year than those day six arrows. Um they're supposed to be a lot stronger and a lot cooler, but we'll let uh, Brian tell you why that is here in a little bit. Well, let's get to him then. Sounds good. All right, so now on the podcast, we have Brian Broderick from Day 6 Gear. What's happening, dude? Hey, how's it going? It's going It's going well, man. Like I said, it's a little warm, but it's actually a lot nicer than it has been the last few days uh, here in Texas, so I'm dealing with it, man. What about you? Hmm. I have no sympathy for you. <laughs> <laughs> that Gulf humidity in Alabama is a real deal, huh? It's it's uh yeah it's brutal. It's it's um a little tough to bear at times. Yeah, I understand, man. I mean, we're here in Northeast Texas, so it's a uh, it's similar probably in some areas of Alabama, but we uh we definitely get some of those some of that humidity, man, and it ain't no fun. I can tell you that, especially when you're in the woods and you don't have any wind, so. Yeah, it's brutal for sure, but we 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 uh we endeavor to persevere, right? That's right, man. That's right. So, uh 
we got to clear the air, man. Casey and I both have a question for you, and I uh, just want to make sure it's all right off the bat. You know, we're we're clear. But uh, roll tide or war eagle? Man, do you have to ask? <laughs> <laughs> we got we got to have a line of delineation here. Yeah, man. we got to know. We got to make some enemies right off the bat here. <laughs> well, it is it is one hundred percent roll tide. There you and, go. Uh, uh, I I uh, I don't know if you know this about me or not, but I have a uh, mixed marriage. Oh, uh, no, oh no! And my wife my wife is an Auburn fan, so uh, that's uh, it's 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 sketchy at times. Oh, I'll, I'll, uh, I mean, you got a reason to brag, but you might not do it all the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> No, uh, I, I, I keep my mouth shut, to be quite honest with you, um, <laughs> because what goes around comes around uh, in this state when it comes to football. Oh, and, that's true. And uh, you're only on top for so long, and then uh, somebody else is going to be better, and, and then you got to just eat crow. But, no, I, <laughs> I uh, you know, one of the most famous games ever was the, the kick six game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and basically knocked Alabama out of the national championship and, and Auburn went to the national championship, I believe that year. And, uh, and, you know, they, they kicked that field goal and, and came short and the guy <laughs> ran it back for a touchdown. Yeah. Well, our camp is about 30, 35 minutes from Auburn and the game was in Auburn. And so my wife and her brother, um, I gave, um, her brother, my tickets uh, cause I just knew it was going to be a blowout and I didn't want to sit there and watch her pout. And, uh, <laughs> so her, her brother's an Auburn fan. So I gave him the tickets to go with her and they went and, uh, we were at the camp watching it. And then that crap happened. And she sent me a text after the game and said, Hey, we're just getting out of the stadium here. Uh, my GPS won't pull up the camp. Can you give me a, uh, address oh, no. that's close to it to get you get me there and i just responded and i put my grandmother's address <laughs> <laughs> oh and when man she got it she said 10 4 and she went to my grandmother's house <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, good man it sounds like uh that little house divided is made for a strong marriage because uh i don't know if everybody would get over get through that situation <laughs> <laughs> it was a bad deal man <laughs> I, I was in depression for a while. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I remember watching it, man. I was oh, yeah. blown away. My dad and I were just like, and I don't have any any stake in it at all. You know, it's not a big deal to me whoever wins. But you know, it was just an unbelievable moment of sports history, man. It was. Does te- Does Texas still uh, the University of Texas still have a team? Yeah, we you don't know, care about them. It's, we, the, uh, it's the team ninety uh, miles to the east. Those are those are the big dogs around here these days. <laughs> I, uh, oh. I I went to A and I was there during the Johnny days and stuff. So uh, it was a it was a fun time. Yeah, and I played ball at SMU in Dallas. So I don't care about Texas either. Yeah. So. Mm. Burn yeah. orange is an ugly color, no matter what state it's in. It's a, it's for it's for guys who um, they like bandwagons and those kind of things. <laughs> you ever heard of those? <laughs> I'm picking up what you're putting down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, there's a, you know, you know how it is. Once you get old, a little bit older, you understand there's good athletes at every school, and it's not their fault that there's snooty people who also go to that school. But <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyways, yeah, no, it's a, uh, it's 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 fun, man, and that's kind of one of the cool things about being in the South is that. Everybody likes the to talk about the all day hunts and all this stuff that you can do during uh, you know deer season and all that. But man, quite honestly, it's pretty fun to go back to deer camp and watch a, a two o'clock CBS game and you know watch Alabama play Auburn and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. that's something that we kind of I don't know. I think as hardcore whitetail guys, you kind of miss out on that whole deer camp dynamic. Yeah, you know it's funny um, uh, when 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 Aaron comes down and deer hunts. He um he just can't he just cannot fathom that I'm gonna stay out of a tree one afternoon and watch Alabama play football. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it just it just he just and he was an incredible football player, mm-hmm. but it just does not register with him at all that 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 is uh um you know something that is that that I would rather miss a hunt hunt over you know and and um. You know, last year, I'll tell y'all one, one quick story because it is a hunting story, <laughs> uh, but it does re- revolve around football. No, not last year, but the year before, uh, I was out at our place in Oklahoma uh, during the Auburn-Alabama game. It was the uh, the Thanksgiving weekend, and my son and I um, 
uh, begged off and made a bunch of promises we'd never keep to our families to <laughs> skip Thanksgiving and go out, out there and hunt because he was in school. We never had a chance to go. So we said, man, this is it. He's off for five days. Man, we're going hunting. So we went out there, and a buddy of mine was out there with us, and he's a big Alabama guy too, and we're sitting in the camp watching the game, and we're just thumping the hell out of Auburn, and, and my son sends me a text and says, I just killed a big one. I said, okay, well, hang tight. <laughs> <laughs> it was like 3 o'clock, and they were just coming back from halftime. I'm like, hang tight. We'll be down there in a little bit. And he said, no, um, come now. It's a really big one. And I said, well, did you see him go down? He goes, oh, yeah, he ran right out and fell. I said, okay, well, he's not going anywhere. Just hang tight. And he's like, no, I, w- I want to get down and get my hands on this deer. Come get me. I'm like, dadgummit. <laughs> so, so we hauled butt down there. And it was a toad uh, that my son killed. So he was he wasn't BSing us anything, you know. And so, um, so I mean, literally, I said, "Hey, man, we'll take pictures up at the camp." We slung that thing in the back of the truck, and we cooked it back up the road to get to the camp. We were gone forty five minutes, <laughs> and we get back, and Auburn's up by ten. Oh, oh no! <laughs> yeah, and I'm like. We're taking the deer back to the river. We put it back right where it was. <laughs> Did you do it? No, uh, no, dude, that would have been something. They man. got they got to win every now and then. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, they can't they can't get any money from their from their boosters to pay their players if they don't win some. <laughs> That's shot, right, man. And it wouldn't be fun if they didn't every once in a while. You know, I mean, you got to right. you got to be able to rub it you know rub it in a few years in a row and then take it here and there and that's part of the deal. It's like it's like hunting, you know. Like you you got to sometimes. Or oftentimes you got to go out and not hardly see anything to appreciate the moments that are great, man. So, yeah. Hey, I remember somebody asked me one time. They said, "Who was your Who was your favorite player ever?" And I said, "Well, my favorite football player ever is Bo Jackson." And <laughs> they said, "Well, he was an Auburn guy." And I said, "Oh yeah, absolutely." And mm-hmm. I said, "The happiest day of my life was the day he left Auburn." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But you know, he's a big bow hunter. Yeah, yeah, he is. Uh, my dad actually uh, is setting a duck blind with Bo in Stuttgart, Arkansas, before. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. So well, I, that's cool. I've been fortunate enough to Kobe a fish with him, but I, I have not hunted with him at all. And uh, but he's a he's a unique individual. Yeah, yeah. He was uh, he was a special type of breed man that's for sure he was uh he was incredible he probably when he left auburn he uh, he might have carried a few alabama players on his back somewhere <laughs> as he was leaving <laughs> you know what i mean i know i know he uh i know he definitely freight trained a few of them in the pros <laughs> <laughs> yeah he did he did hey let me tell you something real quick it's just kind of a side note it, i can't tell you how how just like at home i feel right now chatting with you as opposed to some guy from michigan or something i just have to say that man you know like i, don't... Hey, I have a lot of customers from michigan <laughs> yeah. um and a lot of customers from pennsylvania so why don't you say delaware <laughs> yeah delaware. no it's uh, i i definitely uh i definitely appreciate guys like jeff sturgis you know and some of those guys that really have so much just expertise and experience dealing with deer and and they come from michigan but they don't sound like home you know is my point like you That's you right. basically you i mean there's something you sound just like somebody from East Texas. You know what I mean? Like it ain't any different. Than, oh, don't insult him now. Come yeah, on. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that could be an insult. But yeah, we. I mean, we uh, we kind of had the same thing going on. So I appreciate that, man. But um, yeah, the, I, I guess you know into the deer hunting a little bit here. The the uh, question that I have for you, and I've heard have heard different things. I've never hunted Alabama. How many deer do you get to kill there every year? A pile. A pile, huh? <laughs> the stories are yeah, true. They, it's not just folklore. No. So and you can't quote me on this because this is the this is the honest truth. Mm-hmm. I wanna say about I wanna say maybe about ten or fifteen years ago, and the reason that that's a very wide time span. Alabama changed its rule from a we have a four month long season, give or take a few days. But they changed the, 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 the bag limit on deer from a buck and a doe a day for four months, every day for four months, to a doe a day and three bucks. And I think one of them has to be an eight point maybe. <laughs> but anyway, the reason I say don't quote me on this, because I didn't even know that that change had taken place for like three years. Oh, man. And. I swear, 
I just don't ever keep up with stuff. I'm not a social media guy. And, you know, we're in our own little bubble. And and my son and I were coming out of, of the camp. We were going down this county road. And the game wardens had a roadblock. And they stopped. And they said, y'all have a deer. And we said, yes, sir, we do. And um, and he, he said, who killed it? And I said, my son did. And so And he wasn't old enough to have a license then. And um, he said, well, you know, technically you're supposed to fill out your, your, you know, your, uh, your hunt harvest report for your three bucks. You don't have that. But, you know, he's a minor. He's not, he's not required to have a license, but you technically should have had that. And I felt like the biggest idiot because I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. Mm-hmm. And it had, been, it had been in effect for like three years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Man, there's something about it. Like, uh we like to be from the South, okay? But some of these Western states and stuff, they've got things figured out a little bit better than we do for some reason. Because Tyler and I were just talking about this today. Uh, we just did, we have a draw in Texas for some random public hunts and stuff. And it's so complicated, and they, the rules change like almost every year. It's like, I don't know why we can't just simplify the thing. But mm-hmm. they just. Yeah, what's the what's the one down there at the Big Bend? Um, yeah. The, yeah. The, the, mule, the mule deer hunt. Uh, at the Big Bend uh, National Park, National what's State it Park, it's probably State, State Park. Park. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that one's so daggum convoluted. You know, if you don't, you know, if you don't get drawn or whatever, they still have a thing where you can pull up and get on a wait list. Oh yeah, yeah. I think in. you can do that on most of them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, we we uh, we tried to pull do that a couple of times. It was a bit of a goat rope. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I applied for. A, okay, so I don't know how this even works, but Texas, there's some BLM land up in the Panhandle, and I applied for that. Uh, and I don't know how the state regulates a hunt on a BLM land and makes it. Uh, I don't know a special draw. I don't understand it, you know. And it's like not everybody even knows about it, and. I don't know. It's the, just kind of ridiculous. The point system, like nobody knows how, what it takes to draw hunts, really. I mean, I've called I've called people at the state, and they just can't really tell you a whole lot about it. So it's kind of like, well, how does how, <laughs> if you don't know, who knows? <laughs> well, I, I don't know how all that deal works either. I do know that uh, – did I answer your first question there? Uh, I don't know. We were just talking. What were we talking about? <laughs> yeah. This is going to be a very organized, succinct <laughs> delivery of a good message here. See, this is, see, this is what, you know, you do feel like I'm talking to somebody at home at the same time. That's the problem, you know. <laughs> at home, we just talk, and we don't really pay much attention to what we're, yeah. what we're trying to get to. Yeah. I always have to call people back after I call them and go, oh, I know we talked for an hour and 20 minutes, but the reason I called you oh, was... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but no we kill we what you asked me was so now our bag limit is uh a doe a day um and three bucks uh per season and one of them has to be an eight point um i think it's crazy so, man. i know what I know, I know i'm never going to kill more than three bucks i normally only kill two in alabama mm-hmm. um and uh because i try to leave you know i try to have good hunting for everybody that comes and, and don't want to be a glutton when it comes to the, the good deer. But, uh, but I, I shoot a lot of the does just because we kind of have to. And I think you guys go through the same kind of, um, same kind of, uh, management program where y'all try to really work on your does. Yeah. yeah. We, I mean, we're, I guess QDM was kind of started in Texas, but we don't, we don't have uh, quite the same liberal limits that you guys do at all. It's, I think the most uh, deer you could kill in a county would be five in a year. So yeah, because y'all have the three buck counties and the two buck counties. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yep. and yeah. there's I've, more I've confusing regulations. <laughs> I've hunted in y'all state since uh, I think the first year I hunted over there. I hunted down in uh, Catula. Oh, yeah, and, that's uh, great place. It, it was good. Um, I hunted. I think that was ninety. It had been 94, 95. That's the first year I hunted down there. And it was a, one of those day leases. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and I remember we were paying $200 a day Ooh. and Dang. man, I had to sell stuff. And, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you know, to make that deal work. Yeah. Uh, cause I mean, I was broke as a joke back then and uh, gosh, I would have been probably 20, something like that. And, uh, anyway, we, we went down there and, and, um, the guy was supposed to meet us. He lived in Corpus Christi and he was going to meet us there at the ranch, take our money, show us around. And then he was going to bounce. And so 
there was three of us there and, and, uh, we waited and the guy never showed. We didn't know where to go. And we missed the first afternoon of hunting, man. I mean, everybody is bent up and mad and, and I kind of organized the things. Everybody's kind of <laughs> grousing at me about it. Next morning, you guys not answering his phone. Next morning, no show. We're not, we missed the morning hunt and now everybody's really mad. And then the lady that actually owned the ranch, I'm telling you, this lady was a piece of work. She pulled up and she had, uh, I guess, a farmhand in the passenger seat with her. And she outweighed him by probably at least 250. Oh, and, uh, no, dude, that's a lot. No. Are you sure about that? <laughs> I'm, no, I'm telling you. I mean, she was, she was, uh, yeah, yeah, she was, she was top of the scale. So um, she kept her chewing tobacco oh, yep. in her bra. Oh, hot mm. dog. Yeah. Mm. So anyway, she pulls up and tells us that the guy that we were supposed to hunt with had gotten killed in a car wreck on oh. the way over there. Oh no! Had had hit a hog and and wrecked and died. Golly! And yeah. And so, um, so she said, "Y'all need to go home." Yeah. And so we started to get leave, and then she said, "Hey, what was he going to charge y'all?" And, um, and so we told her and, and she said, okay, well y'all hop on the back of the truck. She had a flatbed. She said, I'll drive y'all around and show you the ranch. So this thing was like 3000 acres. She drove us around on the back of a flatbed for like four hours. Oh. <laughs> I, dude, I, I, I mean, I, when I got home, I had the worst sinus infection. I had so much yep. talcum powder dust up my yeah. nose. Yep. My eyes were bleeding like bloodshot bleed. It was the most God awful thing. Um, but that was my first trip to Texas. I said, God, I'll never come back to this place again as long as I live. And shoot, I think I've been over there every year since. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Man, back in 90, 94, that had been a pretty high end day lease. I feel like 200 bucks, you know, back then and get you something pretty good. I mean, yeah, I guess 3,000 3, acres is a pretty good sized chunk. But, uh, so yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a trailer there yeah. that was pretty nice. And we were the only three people there. And uh, we had the whole thing to ourselves. And um, so, you know, all my trips are open-ended. You know, when I leave, I tell my wife, you know, hey, this is when we're supposed to be back, but that's just a, like a suggestion. <laughs> yep. So we ended up staying another two or three days and hunting, and, and uh, we figured it out. There were some really good deer on that place. And when I left out of there, uh, that was actually in Artesia Wells, which is the next exit south of Katua. Mm -hmm. And when we when we left we went we headed out we went to lunch at that big restaurant there just east of Catula there right at the edge of town we went there and they were you know there were big deer in the back of every truck and they you know they had uh there was a place they were you know scoring deer i can't remember the name of that place and yeah was, is that anyway, los Cazadores? Uh, yeah. yeah yeah i yeah, think that's where so it is we, in Catula. yeah we were freaking out and i mean i killed like a hundred inch eight point i thought i was the man <laughs> you know 100 inch 100 pound eight point yeah. Right? <laughs> oh yeah it was it was glorious i said man y'all throw some bags over the back of that thing so nobody sees it uh, but <laughs> but anyway i met a guy there that was a ranch manager and we hit it off and we sat in that place and and drank beer and and ate barbecue and just had a good time and he says hey i'm moving ranches next year the ranch i'm going to uh hasn't been hunted but they want me to start an operation you guys want to come do call hunts well, i'd never heard of a call hunt or a management hunt or anything like that and uh so we went over there the next year and did that and and i remember i killed a like 148 inch seven point oh my that, that was a like a 1500 hundred dollar call buck oh. <laughs> I was like, man, if this is their calls, I love Texas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what ranch was that on? Well, you know, that ranch would have been, back then it was called the Kalig Ranch, and it was a, a guy that had maybe four dealerships over there or some kind of car dealerships. Mm -hmm. But before he owned it, it was Nolan Ryan's ranch. Mm. Okay. And then uh, that guy had it, and I think I'm saying the name right. This is years and years ago, guys, like 24 years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, I believe the ranch changed hands after that, and who knows? But I don't know who, where it is, whose it is now. But it yeah. was just east of Catula a little bit. And, yeah. 
That's cool. I love it out there. Yeah, yeah. it's awesome. I spent a little bit of time down there. Um, actually got to hunt. Um, well, we stayed at the Faith Ranch. I'm sure you've heard of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we hunted the Briscoe Chupadera down there. Um, which is basically on the Rio, I think. Um, but yeah, it's incredible. It's crazy how you can just like, I think we drove, uh, once we hit Caliche road, uh, off of like blacktop, we drove like 27 miles and like dead ended into the faith ranch. And then the Briscoe Chup was on the like South side of that, I believe. Um, I was a lot younger, so I don't know exactly, <laughs> but I do know that 27 miles of Caliche Road and dead ending into a ranch in, in basically Mexico is pretty remote, you know? <laughs> oh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. I love it down there, man. Mm-hmm. We uh, we hunted, we mule deer hunted down just north of that uh, Big Bend State Park. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. We mule deer hunted on a ranch down there after we tried to do the big Ben thing. And, and so we met some people down there and, and booked some hunts. Uh, and it was just a thing where they, you know, let us stay in this little old ratty barn and set up camp there. And then yeah. we just hunted on our own. Um, near Terlingua down there. Oh, I, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. I know mm-hmm. we turned South. Uh, literally it was like the, the next road south of this this road was the entrance to that Big Bend State Park where you go go for the hunt. Oh yeah, you're way down there. I worked out yeah. there quite a bit. I did. I used to do some game capture stuff, catching exotics and whatnot. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, speaking of weird Texas regulations, uh, elk are an exotic in Texas. So yeah. explain that. But uh, I was out there near Terlingua, near the park, catching elk on top of a mesa for a couple months. That's kind of a cool little little gig. That and. Uh, all that eradication for the bighorns. So that's cool country, man. That's I love that country out there. It's like you're in a different world. It's, it is. I mean, we could see the river from like any time we'd hike up to a high point to glass. I mean, we we were looking down on the river and um man, it just was weird, you know, you're sitting there hunting and you're glassing one way and there's some odd ad and you're glassing another way and there's this incredible mule deer and um you know, and then, uh, you know, one, one, one little mountain range that they had, you know, had some desert sheep in it and man, they were protecting those things like, you know, like gold. And yeah. so, mm-hmm. but you're looking across the river to different country. It was just, a, it's just a, it's just a weird feeling being down there and, and, um, you know, and you hear all the sketchy stories and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. But, yeah. So it added another kind of uh, element of, of excitement to it. And uh, I, I loved it down there. We went a few years. It's one of my, probably, I'll be honest with you, that's probably one of my favorite places I've hunted on this planet that's is, cool. uh, is West Texas down there on that river. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, um, you're speaking of like shady stuff down there. Um, I knew a guy, uh, that went to prison and <laughs> so this is a little bit of a story. Um, he went to prison and got offered, um, you know, he was, he liked to deer hunt a lot or whatever. And, uh, he got offered a job by basically the cartel to run a, uh, like run a deer hunting ranch down in South Texas, down in the, the golden triangle or whatever, you know, um, he wanted, they wanted him to run the operation and be like the face of this hunting operation so that they can move drugs through, through the hunting operation basically. And so he was like, ah, I don't think I'm going to do that. And I've had enough jail at this point, you know, so, but, uh, crazy stuff happening. That's, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. We were in, um, Hebronville this year mm-hmm. and, um, we were hunting just South of Hebronville and, uh, the ranch we were on there, um, their their little homestead cab or the little homestead house ranch house it was the original house we don't know how old this thing was and um so but they don't even lock the thing anymore because Mm -hmm. every time they locked it it just got destroyed with them breaking in and and the drug runners and all would just they basically just use it like it's theirs as they're moving through Mm -hmm. so um i mean you know i didn't get a lot of good sleep when I was down there this I year. They're yeah. telling us all this stuff. There's not even a dead gum lock on the door. Yeah, it's weird. We're down there, we're down there bow hunting, you know. And so, yep. you know, I called the guy that was coming. I said, "Man, does anybody have a gun?" 
I need anybody. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I think I've got one in my pickup. I'm like, well, how about leave it out here with us? <laughs> yeah. It's weird, man. I'm telling you. My, my uh, wife's cousin last year was down in South Texas hunting, and he straight up has cell phone video. He's hunting one of those – Uh, They're like a mirror blind. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. It reflects the ground, you know, or whatever. Uh, Yeah. He was hunting in one of those, and literally, I think there's like nine dudes in black, just complete black ski masks, black T-shirts, and pants, and they just go, they're literally within bow range of him. Like, they run across this, like, Sendero real quick, and then, you know, slow down once they get in the brush and just keep on walking. It's pretty pretty hair-raising, you know, so... It's it's weird, yeah, it's, man. It's weird down there. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff going to, going yeah. on. It's uh, it kind of makes you think about it uh, in different <laughs> well, ways. Well, they got gri- they got grizzlies in Wyoming, and then you got That's drug it. runners in Texas. Everybody's yeah. got the the predators. Yeah. That's why uh, I stay in Colorado usually to go elk hunting. So <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Drugs are legal, yeah. and, and right. there's no grizzlies. Right. <laughs> yeah. The problem is they got liberals there. So oh, oh there man. Well, I stay at Colorado Springs and Denver. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. oh golly so i mean you had it pretty good in alabama is, did you grow up in alabama is that where you're born oh, yeah. raised born and raised so, right here in L- right here in la you've done so much <laughs> <laughs> you've done so much uh traveling like why why did you decide to go and and you've got a wyoming number i think right like how do you how did, why'd you end up going all this these different places and hunting and doing all this well the um it, it's 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 funny. I, I uh, this is really the only thing hunting's probably the only thing I've been remotely decent at, to be honest with you. Yeah. And um, I've done a lot of th- other things and not you know, not done them well. Like I've always, you know, just kind of been successful in hunting, and that was always just what I was addicted to. And so when I was in high school, I was working in a hunting and fishing store, working in the archery department, eventually running that. And, and I just, it was my life. And, and, but there was a lot of guys that would come in, uh, that were taking trips and going places. And I realized that, heck, I wasn't ever going to be able to do any of those trips. If I worked in that store, I was going to have to go out and make some money, uh, in another industry to be able to afford to go hunt and be able to basically dictate my own hours. Um, so that was a good experience, but so, the summer of before I went into my senior year of high school, one of the guys that was working in the shop uh, won or didn't win. He bid on a bear hunt at a um, like some kind of maybe like a Buckmaster's banquet or something. Yeah. And it was <laughs> for him and a guest. And I can't remember what it was, but long story short, it was going to cost me about eight hundred dollars to go bear hunting. Uh, that was gas, tag, everything. So I asked my parents, I said, hey, you know, we're fixing to have to mail in this money for the senior cruise for spring break. It's $400. Um, would y'all just give me that money instead of me going on a cruise and just being stupid for a week um, and let me go on this bear hunt? They're like, yeah. Well, they never asked when it was. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So anyway, uh, uh, I, I got that money and, and sent in, you know, sent in for our tags and all. And then I broke the news after it was too late to back out that I thought it was too late to back out to my parents that it was actually the first week of school uh, oh. my senior year. <laughs> so I skipped, uh, I skipped my first week of my senior year of high school and I went bear hunting, uh, bow hunting. <laughs> and, That's um, cool. And this is funny. The guy that I went with that won that trip or been on that trip, uh, and I'm not—I don't mean this mean to anybody, but he had a really bad stutter. Yeah. And he also smoked. <laughs> and of course, back then people smoked, you mm-hmm. know. So, so, but he had a nicer car than I did, so we were going to take his car. And then another guy decided he wanted to go, and he was going to pay the outfitter to go hunt with us. This guy that went with us also stuttered and smoked. <laughs> And I drove from Greenbow, Alabama to Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. Oh, with my Two goodness. guys in a forerunner, Toyota forerunner, two guys that smoked and stuttered. And <laughs> up until that point, I was, oh gosh, I was probably 
well, I just turned 18, I guess, or fixed to turn 18. Up to that point, I had never tried a beer. I had never tasted one. I didn't have any interest. When I got out of that, when I got out of that truck at that guy's house, he said, you guys want a beer? And I said, yes. <laughs> I have never been so stressed in my life. Oh. And uh, I called my parents and I begged them to loan me the money to fly home. Oh, wow. And they said, no, you dug that hole. And you can put the dirt back in it. So I had to ride all the way back with those guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that was terrible. my first hunt, you know, on the road. And uh, man, I just I, I don't know I don't know how to describe it, guys. I just love seeing new country and 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 uh, different ways of, of doing things and, and you know different cultures and so. Um, Man, as, as as soon as I graduated the next year, I had decided that I was going to go to school in the summer directly out of high school and take the fall off instead of the summers. Mm, uh, and the smart. fall was going to be my summer, um, uh, my, you know, my summer. Yeah. And so everybody's like, oh, you're crazy. It's when football season and the parties. And I'm like, well, I don't party. I'm not a drinker. So, you know, I'm going to go hunting. So every year. I would go to school in the summer, and then about the 15th or 20th of August, I would put a camper shell on my truck. I'd load it up, and I headed out west in 91. That was my first year. Uh, and uh, I've been doing that ever since. And, I, you know, I, back then I would go elk hunting um, like three different states, Idaho, Colorado, and New Mexico, and just start north and work my way down. Man. And, um did that for years, and then once I got married, my wife was like, man, you know, well, I want you to keep doing what you're doing, keep you charged, you know, but I want you to start going with other people. I just don't want you to go by yourself anymore. It's just mm. not safe. And so I started hunting with people, and then when I started hunting with people, I started doing other things like caribou hunts and moose hunts and other countries and things like that, and I just kind of became the guy that, that – because there wasn't a lot of people in the South or especially in Alabama that did those kind of things. So guys would approach me and say, Hey, if you can put it together, we'll pay part of your deal. And so I was like a, you know, an unofficial like booking guy. You yeah. Know, I'd yeah. Like an outfitter. Trips, Dude, hosted these older trips. guys would, yeah. I, yeah. Something like that. I guess you call that. And these older guys, they had, you know, real money and real jobs. And, um, <laughs> so they could afford to, you know, carve up five hundred dollars a piece to help cover mine, and that's how I got to do all that stuff. That's cool. How man. are you that smart at eighteen? <laughs> like, how did you no, figure that out? No, I, I wouldn't say smart. I would say um, um, calculated and and um, uh, strategic. Because I, I'm telling you, man, back then I would do anything for a piece of hunting property. I, I mean, whatever it took. I mean, if I had to mow this guy's grass or what, I mean, I'd do anything. If I didn't know the person, I'd find somebody they knew that I knew and figure out a way to, I mean, whatever it took to get on the next hunt, the next deal, I focused on that. And, you know, my parents would always say, gosh, if you would just put half of that effort into school and business, you'd already be a millionaire by 25. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you know? but then you would uh, then you'd have to maintain all that crap and not go hunting for most of your life, you know, yeah. the young part of your life at least. So oh, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm a big I'm a firm believer in uh, a net worth of time yep. over a net worth of of cash. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I just really really um, put a lot of value on uh, time and and experiences mm-hmm. uh, because I don't know anybody that's been buried with any of their money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, at least get to use it once they are, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. No That's kidding. Right. Yeah, man. Um, I, I hope there's not any left to line my casket. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way mine's going right now. So <laughs> I don't even get to buy a casket. So you know, right there. With you. That's right. <laughs> so, but you were doing all this like pretty much uh, in the beginning stages of the internet. How did you know, like, how to head off to Idaho, Wyoming, <laughs> Colorado, do that, and do that? Man, you want to talk about the most just haphazard ramshackle operation that I had. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I would pack in, I didn't know that having 80 pounds was too much. Yeah. You know, I didn't know that I shouldn't carry my little 
you know, Coleman stove in there in my back. I mean, I didn't know <laughs> different, you know, I didn't know all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, I was carrying fish and gear and, you know, I was buying my, my sleeping bags and my tents at, at, you know, Walmart and, you know, and I'd pass these guys on the trail sometimes and go, man, where in the hell did they come from and where are they going? Their pack is the size of my, you know, date, my panty pack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, they look like they're living back here, but they don't have anything you know, they're not carrying anything. And man, my, you know, I look like I had a, a, you know, a Volkswagen on my back. <laughs> and so, um, anyway, I just didn't know. I, I had no idea, but, but I, but I found the hunting to be pretty easy to figure out. And I found the hunting, uh, you know, I found a lot of success doing it. And I only think it was because we had so much interaction with game growing up mm-hmm. that it was just, it was just second nature to, you know, find sign, figure it out, figure out where they were going, understanding what they were trying to do and get on them, you know, mm-hmm. it just, and, and I think that only comes from just having lots and lots of interactions with wildlife, you know, and mm-hmm. in the South it's year round. Yeah. Do, do you think that like now that we do have the internet and guys have, you know, been able and obviously equipment and stuff has gotten better but guys are able to go in lighter and just know so much more about animals and have gps on your phone and all this and that do you think that it's gotten harder to kill animals in the back country 100 percent. i mean i can tell you that i can tell you that uh well i can tell you this i mean i y'all know this i hunted the gila uh, four out of five years, I drew like the premier unit still to this day, four out of five years mm-hmm. as a non-resident mm. back then. Yeah. And, and out of those four or those five years, uh, not on the roads, but actually in the, in the field hunting on foot, I only had an interaction with another hunter once. Mm-hmm. Wow. And now it is just a gong show. And so, you know, uh, everybody, you know, Google earth, that's been the kiss of death. Um, and then, you know, everybody marks these points, you know, they, they have all these apps with all these trails and they're basically marking these points that are the farthest in the middle from all the trails around them. And they're like, okay, that's where we're going to go. It's the most remote. So there's really no secrets, no hideaways, no nothing anymore. If you're not, you know, navigating off of a compass and a paper map. Mm -hmm. Um, so but I'll tell you now that as far as elk hunting goes, the best elk hunters I know are the guys that hunt out of the hunt. Uh, they get in their truck every morning and they come back to a camp in their truck every night. Really? Yeah, they're not backpack guys. Wow. What's that? Is, why is that? Why do you think that is? Well, I just think everybody's walking past a lot of elk. Yeah. 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 I, uh, I talked to a guy who used to be a horse packer there in the Gila. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, when I was trying to figure out all the stuff, and I think I think now we're going to do our best just to get it out on our own backs. But I was talking, you know, to meat packers and stuff and still have a number one. Anyways, doesn't matter. Um, a guy used to be a meat packer, and that's exactly what he said. He said, man, honestly, if you go three quarters of a mile to about two miles, you're going to see a bunch of elk. And then there's going to be a big gap because that's where all the outfitters and horse guys and backpackers and all that go to. And he said, right. I mean, he's killed some big elk right there, you know. Not far from the trailhead because everybody just you're so enamored with the idea of going way back, and uh, I don't know I I still am enamored with the idea of going way back and I probably <laughs> will you know but like there's something to be said for it for sure I mean yeah g- golly we go hunt you know out of state or whatever for whitetails and it's crazy how many big bucks you can see from the road if you drive around and you you pay attention. It's, yeah. Um, uh... You talk, did you talk to Jim? I talked to BJ. Mater? Oh, okay, because uh, Jim Mater is a packer in the Gila. That he, yeah. did, he doesn't do it anymore, but he used to do it. But he, he was one of the guys that told me the same thing. Is, yeah. He's like, man, don't, don't go so far from the trailhead. They're, they're not that far away. Um, so, um, yeah, hopefully. Uh, I just think people are walking through a lot of elk. Yeah, yeah. I see it a lot, you know, even in, in our uh, OTC units that we go to in Colorado. You know, the people, they'll, and it, it's different because there's not a lot of people walking, but they're on the ATVs, and they think you got to go as far down these logging roads as you can to, to go find the elk. Well, man, the elk are up top. 
you know, you, you, where you're camping, there's elk. So it's not, you just got to figure out and learn more about, you know, animal ecology and stuff like that and figure out where they're at as opposed to just thinking that, you know, just distance alone is going to kill you the animal. That's just not how it works. No. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I um, the last, make sure I get this right. <laughs> yeah. I think the last bull I killed in Colorado was, I want to say it was 2000. Thir- 12 or 13 the mm-hmm. last bull i killed in colorado it's been a while and the reason is is in february yeah it was 2012 the fall of 12 in 2000 the, the, in february of 2013 i had a building collapse uh on top of me while i was in it oh my and gosh so, yeah and i had to um you know start walking again all that jazz it it, it really threw a curveball um uh, on my hunting for a while. And, and, um, and actually, uh, I turned 40 in a hospital bed and I feel like I went from 39 to 80, <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> you know, with that, with that accident, yeah. you know, it just, it, it was, it was devastating. But anyway, <clears throat> but that last public land hunt, the last bull I killed in Colorado was 2012. And I've killed some since then, but it's not been public land stuff, but, mm-hmm. um, but I remember, I, I killed a bull on the second afternoon and on the way in to where I killed that bull, I found a spot. And so I killed that bull that afternoon, h- hiked back out. We were camped right on the road. I hiked back out a mile to the road. Uh, my buddy came in. I said, Hey, I found a spot. Um, uh, I think we can get the truck to where, I think I can drive the truck right to where I killed this bull. <laughs> and um, I said, why don't you ride back there with me? I'll stop. I'll walk you up this, this basin and, and show you where, you know, where you should go. And then I'll go, you know, work that bull up. And uh, um, he's like, no, I'll help you. I'm like, man, I, if I can get the truck to it, I don't really need your help. You can go hunt. But anyway, while I'm cutting that bull up, this guy missed a bull and killed a bull. <laughs> Golly. And no kidding. And so I got, I literally backed the truck up to this thing. Now I may have scratched the guy's truck up a little bit. He may not have been happy about it. <laughs> um, and he had just got these pretty rims on it too. Oh. It was pretty funny. But anyway, I, I, lo- I cut that bull up, loaded him up and I pulled back up to where I let, let him go. And I'd made it about a hundred yards up this basin. I was going to hike up there, you know, and just get up high in glass and watch him. And I could see him walking out. And, um, so we went up there and, and worked that bull up and, uh, uh, we had to walk him back, but it was all downhill to the truck about, I don't know, maybe half a mile. So, you know, we had two bulls by lunch on day three, we were less than a mile from the main County road and we were on a logging road. Um, and we were headed home. There you so, go. That's cool, man. With a truck full of elk. <laughs> yeah. It was riding low. I mean, <laughs> bet. uh, for sure. And I mean, we if y'all had to pick up that gal from Catula. You couldn't have made it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the, 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 um, the, the, the funny part was, is that the truck was so dusty kind of by design, because once I realized how bad I'd scratched this truck up, <laughs> um, I, I kind of ran up and down this road a bunch before I went up to park to get him trying to dust the truck all up. Because mm-hmm. I didn't want him to see all those, you know, South Alabama racing stripes on it. So <laughs> I dusted his truck all up. Of course, he was on cloud nine uh, about his bull and all. So the first night we stopped, I can't remember where we were, maybe. I can't remember. But anyway, we stopped at a hotel and woke up that morning and it was raining. I was like, oh, crap. And we walked out there and he saw his truck. Oh. Oh my God. It was a quiet ride that second day. Oh. He was mad. It was a black truck, black rims. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it man. Was, it rough. was a bad deal. Yeah. But, uh, but that, but literally, though, I mean, we killed those two bulls a mile from a county road and, and, and drove to one of them. So, man, that's do, cool. do you feel like that's like a, that's one of those spots that, like, year after year is going to be? possibly good or is it just like well this is just where the pressure put them that year or whatever it's just where they were that year yeah. so 
two years ago, uh, I packed into the maroon bales like a complete moron. <laughs> um, uh, Isn't that Aaron weird? Told, yeah, don't Aaron they Aaron send and, the jokers in there? And then who Aaron and Frank they send the people to maroon bales when they like they ask them where to go. <laughs> That's exactly what they did to <laughs> That's me. What I thought. <laughs> yeah, Aaron sent me in there, and I about half died. I mean, I told him that you know I hadn't been walking but a couple years here, buddy. You know, give me an easy walk. It's all oh, this is easy, and. Man, I about died, and I had my nephew with me, and he was 28, so he was fine. He runs marathons and all. (laughs) When I saw him gassed out, I was sitting there thinking, yeah, I'm going to die on the side of this mountain. (laughs) uh, So, but anyway, we went back in there, and and we had some, we had some decent success, but there were, we were, gosh, I can't remember how far back we were, guys, but I mean, you had to pump daylight in. We were way back there, (laughs) and Maybe five or six miles, but it was a you know we're like we gained like maybe three to four thousand feet. Oh my! And uh, so we were up you know up above tree line and and but there were elk in there, but there were as many people back in that hellhole as there were elk, and I'm thinking this is ridiculous. So we hunted in there, and then we came out, and then we went. We drove about three hours up to where we, I just told you we'd kill those two bulls and we hunted in there and they just, they weren't there. The sign wasn't there that the elk weren't there. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just the way it is. You've got to be able to move. And so we packed up again and then we drove four hours south to the Southern part of the state to another spot I'd hunted. And it was only a mile off the road, but it was straight up like 2,800 feet from the road to where the elk were. And, uh, I about died going up that thing. But <laughs> we, got, we got up there and we got all in them then and did all right. But, yeah, that's um, cool. but I think one of the things I would take away from that is, is that if you go into these elk hunts where you're pigeonholed to one spot, especially if it's a, uh, a, a wilderness hunt and you're going to do this epic pack in. Yeah. Well, if you get in there and there's people and there's no elk, well, you better have plan B, C, D, E, and F. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and when you have to start going to those auxiliary plans, it's way better to be mobile uh, and moving around locations for, via vehicle versus carrying a, a 60, 70 pound pack around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It makes so, sense. Yeah. So anyway, it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's a tough game right now. I mean, I don't want to deter people because it's so much fun, but I want to manage expectations mm-hmm. and that it's, it's a very low success rate hunt uh, for public land for elk, uh, especially archery hunting, really any kind of hunting um, nowadays, just because of the pressure and the people and, and the elk seem to know where the private is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. It's uh, it's weird that it gets tougher as uh, it's supposed to get easier as technology gets better. It's a strange <laughs> thing, but yeah. Do you think um, that hunting whitetails makes you a better elk hunter, or do you think hunting elk make you a better whitetail hunter? Oh no, no, no. I think I think I think hunting whitetails. Um, I think hunting whitetails makes you a a, a better hunter all the way around. Yeah. I don't think. I don't think that the the elk makes you that elk makes you a better hunter at all. I think uh, elk makes you a more physical hunter. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and it makes you a, a, a more mentally tough hunter because um, it's hard. Even when you see elk and you find them, uh, the rate that they walk at a, just a basic walk is a trot for a man. Mm-hmm. Um, so the amount of ground that you have to cover once you've even engaged with elk is is incredible, and it, it's just so physically demanding. And then if you get one on the ground, you know it is it's one of the most grueling, you know, tasks that you can undertake. And um, but I'll say this: that hunting whitetails makes you a better killer. And there's very there's been very few times to where i've gotten something in what i call inside my wire um that 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 you know i i screw it up just because there's been just so many repetitive uh 
situations of releasing an arrow through an animal, you mm-hmm. know? Right. Yeah, it makes sense. So I, I, I think everybody usually gets an opportunity. Like if they go on some kind of hunt, whether it's a mule deer, elk, or moose, everybody usually comes back with a story and they have an opportunity. It, the difference is, is those that capitalize on it. And the guys that hunt southern whitetails or whitetails where there's high population – they just have those opportunities to practice, you know, mm-hmm. and if practice wasn't necessary, I mean, the, the pro athletes would just show up for the games. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them do. Some of them try that. <laughs> it didn't work good. No, it doesn't. You yeah. know, I, uh, I did feral hog control for a couple of years for the state <clears throat> and, uh, I only killed a couple, a couple of them with a bow and that was in urban areas. But, uh, it's still, I feel like it's made me such a better killer. Like you were saying, because now, being a trigger man, it doesn't mean anything. Or I shouldn't say it that way. It, it's a different feeling, to where um, I don't have this like super anticipation of squeezing that release and and, and releasing the arrow like I, I used to would have. Because I've you've killed so many things, you've shot so much stuff. Like you know what that next uh, repercussion is of pulling that trigger, and it, it makes That's a right. big difference in in how that feels to you. I feel like it it like it doesn't even have to be you got to kill a bunch of whitetails to become a good whitetail killer. You know, it can be even more separate from that. But so there's something to taking a bunch of animals that really helps you in, like, your whole understanding of the process. Yeah, I, and, and, I, and I'll tell you this. I mean, guys that say elk don't duck arrows, <laughs> they, they, had, they haven't elk hunted enough. Uh, or they just hadn't seen it. I don't know what the situation is, but I've, I mean, and I'm not going to say that they have the reaction time of a whitetail, but they can scare you how fast they can move and change position before that arrow gets there. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when you shoot Southern whitetails for 25 years and then you go on an elk hunt, you're instinctively holding in that low triangle, that mm-hmm. lower third of the lower third. Um, you're always holding there and that's where you're focusing because that's just what's been drilled into your brain that you always have to have a low aim point. So when that elk does drop, whether you really notice it or not, you're still getting vitals. And, and I've seen more elk lost with a high hit in no man's land above Mm -hmm. the lung, below the spine, which they have a lot more real estate there for, uh, an, you know, not a non-mortal wound than a, than a whitetail does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So is it the agility of like a southern deer, do you think, or is it just the overall pressure um, that causes them to be more jumpy, or what do you think it is? Mm, they're crackheads, man. I mean, <laughs> there's no other way to put it. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're just flat-out crackheads. I mean, they, they're super agile. They're just twitching all the time. I mean, if you're sitting there watching one, their muscles are twitching. Mm -hmm. Um, They're just, they're just stressed out Mm -hmm. and, you know, constantly freaked out. And, and, uh, you know, they know what a hunter predator is. I mean, it's, you know, there was a time when animals didn't know what a hunter predator was, a human predator. They, they knew what their, their natural predators were, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the canine species and the bears and the, you know, uh, cat species and all that. I mean, they, they knew all that. And a deer knows what a, you know, a, a, a coyote smells like and a bobcat. They know what all that stuff smells like. They know what a bear smells like. They know what they're looking for with those. Well, you know, in the South, those deer put a person and a human, you know, in that same category. They, they know that's what we're there to do. And, and, uh, it's, 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 it's one of the things that's on their radar, you know? Mm-hmm. So you go to the Midwest, those deer are different animals. White tails out there, are, they're just super easy to kill. You mm-hmm. know I mean? That's why all your famous white tail guys all live in the Midwest. Yeah. You know, you put them in the South, they wouldn't cut a hair. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's funny. That is funny. Casey yeah. just cut hair on one of them southern whitetails a few years I ago. I did. Man, I had a deer come out of his skin, a big public land deer, and just, I mean, I aimed, like, at the bottom of the brisket at this deer at 31 yards, and I barely cut hair on its back. You know, it's just, it's crazy. 
how much they move. And then, I, I don't know, maybe it's a body size thing, too, because, you know, you got those deer that are pushing 300 pounds up there up north. It's just hard to get that much weight moving around. I don't know. But uh, it's uh, – Well, they're, 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 you got to realize they're not reacting to the sounds up there the way these deer in the south are. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're not – they're not hunted at the level that they're hunted in the Southern states. So, you know, there's, there's not that immediate recognition uh, or awareness of that other predator species, the human predator, uh, like it is in the South. And I mean, those Midwest deer, I mean, you, you grunt or especially snort wheeze, dude, they're coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're coming. It's. I mean, I, I'm convinced they can read the hunting magazines because they do <laughs> all the crap that they say they're supposed to do. I mean, think about this. Think about being a, a, a 16, 17-year-old kid in the South, and nobody in your family hunts, but you want to hunt. And, you know, you know that there's a, a wildlife management area down the road from you, and so you go to Bass Pro Shop, and you, you know, buy three or four of those hunting magazines – um, you know, at the cashier line, you take them home and you just consume all that information and you think, oh, I got this stuff figured out. You're probably not going to see a deer. I mean, the first thing you're going to be looking for is an apple orchard and that don't <laughs> exist. You know what I mean? So, well, you know, the, the thing is, is that in the, you know, Southern deer, they don't walk on trails. They walk a hundred yards downwind of the trails blowing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, you find a deer trail in the Midwest, those jokers are using it. I mean, it's I, it's I-20, I-10, and they're rolling. <laughs> so, um, you know, you find a scrape, those jokers actually come to the scrapes in the daylight. <laughs> and, okay, yep. You know, so all this stuff you read in these magazines works out there, but you try to translate that to the South, you're going to struggle, man. If you want to kill big deer in the South, you, you better have uh, uh, some pretty secure property that's not pressured because big deer in the south is solely a function of pressure. Yep. That's it. That is the only way you're going to kill them is pressure or just blind luck. But consistently killing whitetails, it's all about managing pressure and basically having something that you can control the pressure on. And then the other thing is, is in the south, Big deer live in ugly places, mm -hmm. and you can't hunt these pretty hardwood bottoms and big, pretty, you know, sage fields and stuff like that. You're not going to see them. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you better hunt the nastiest, ugliest, three-year-old clear cut on the edge of a cane break uh, and, 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 and glimpse him, you know, 15 minutes after daylight or 15 minutes before dark, because that's it. That's the window. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, both of the, the, the mature deer that I killed this year in Alabama, I killed them out of the same tree and I killed them. They were bedding and they were both bedding in one spot, uh, not together, but in one little area. And uh, I killed both those deer within 100 yards of where they were bedding. Mm -hmm. And both of them were within by 615 in the morning. Now, so and that was peak rut. That's when they're supposed to be dumb. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, you talking about you talking about bedding and buck bedding is like the hot hot thing these days, right? Yeah. Something we found is that it just it's a thing, but it ain't a thing like they say it is. Like you're gonna have bucks that bed somewhere, and then they have 17 other beds they'll they're gonna go they can go to. And southern deer, southern deer do. Yeah, southern deer do not yeah. do not bed in the same place like the Midwest deer do. I'm telling you, man, those jokers, those things out there are dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I I killed a 172 inch six year old buck in a in a in a windbreak, and I don't know what kind of trees they are. I think they're like, I don't know if they're locust trees or Catawba trees, but anyway. It was literally a 30-yard wide strip of trees that was planted to, to be a windbreak on the, on the upside of a field. Uh -huh. and, uh, and that buck was bedding in that thing. Literally, I drove by him on the road, looked in there, saw him. It was blowing 20 miles an hour. I didn't slow down. I just kept going. Mm -hmm. Went all the way to the end, turned around, drove back by. 
went all the way back to the downwind <laughs> had to make sure you believed your eyes. <laughs> I didn't even look at him. I mean, I wasn't going to make eye contact with him. So, um, so anyway, went all the way to the downwind, you know, things 30 yards wide, maybe 100 yards long. Went down there, parked the pickup, crawled into that head of woods, crawled up the edge of it where the quietest part was, right on the fence line, crawled up there and killed that buck, uh, bedded in the wide open uh, in that tree line um, at 15 yards with a recurve. Oh, my, oh my that's gosh. A six, that's a six-year-old, 170-inch deer. You would have never seen that deer in the south. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. You'd never if, where he was bedded. You'd have never seen him, and that, and that deer had been bedding there for ten days straight. Because the reason I know that is, is I was hunting that deer, and I thought he was coming off the river into this wheat field because I was hunting all around the wheat field. I never laid eyes on him, but every day when I'd come out, he's out in the wheat field, mm-hmm. and I'm going, "Where is he coming from?" I had <laughs> fifteen cameras around this wheat field trying to find where he was coming from. He was bedding on the edge of it in a 30 yard wide open strip of woods, and I drove past him for 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> man, oh, that's crazy. That's yep. a dream scenario. Oh, though, dude, man. we Ta-da. talk, we talk Gosh. about it all the time. We're like, you know, you see it on like monster bucks where there's like horns sticking oh, out of a milo field, or like, you know, you're sitting there and you drive by one of these, you know, shelter belts and they're in there, and it just never happens, you know. We talk about how we're waiting on that. We're waiting on that moment to happen for us. Well, I tell you, I always tell guys when they come down from other parts of the country and hunt with me in the south, and they go, "Man, why don't y'all hunt all day?" Or you know, spot and stalk and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, I just tell them, "Look, you go do what you want to do. I'm going to come in here. And I'm going to cook some biscuits and some gravy. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I'm going to watch football." And then we're going to go back out about 2.30 or 3, and we're going to be paired over with deer. Yeah. But if you want to go hunt now, you go ahead. Do your thing, you know. But yep. I, I always tell them, go spend all day midday out there and go jump one doe for me. <laughs> go find one bedded doe and come back and tell me where you found one bedded deer, buck or doe. Go find me one bedded deer and come back. <laughs> you can't do it. No. It's funny, you man. You cannot find them during the – I mean, they – disappear they do it's it's a real deal like I, I always we always talk to guys you know we talk to a lot of guys from the midwest obviously for obvious reasons and and uh you know they they talk about you know hunting all day and this and that and and i just did not grow up doing it that way and there's a reason it's because we we hunted we grew up hunting in texas you know and there you just don't see anything in the middle of the day and so uh it's it's you know it's it's a different different kind of deal and i guess like um, you know, we always talk, Casey and I always talk about how stereotypes are kind of a thing, like they're, they're a thing for a reason a lot of times and the stereotype of, uh, or, or I guess you could say more like culture of us in the South watching football in the middle of the day and eating chips and salsa at lunch is because of the, the circumstances that we've kind of come up on, I guess, you know, and our, our parents and, and everything. I'll tell you this guys, I mean, hunting in the South you kill a big deer it is a game of chess not only with the animal itself but it's also with the other hunters that you hunt with because hunting in the south is expensive Mm -hmm. and so you have to share your leases or your camps or whatever with other guys Mm -hmm. so you've got you've got such a harder task because you're not only working that deer you're working around other guys so you know you've got to become a master gar holer. You've got to be able to gar hole <laughs> the other guys uh, and keep them. And listen, it is not a sin to lie about what you've seen when you're hunting. That is, you're going to get a pass on that. Okay, I'm convinced. So when you come out and you hadn't seen anything, but you tell all your buddies that you saw a really nice deer and you could have killed him, but you just see what what you wanted, and they go racing over to where you were. Um, to hunt the deer that doesn't exist, that's not a sin, okay? <laughs> so that is, that's acceptable in the South. See, that's so, advice that we've never gotten on this podcast, that's right. so that's well, good. Well, and here's the other thing. You talk about coming back, watching football. Let me tell you, if you know how to cook, step your game up, all right? 
So when you come, when you go come back and you're going to cook a breakfast casserole, put heat in. Make sure to put some spices in it. <laughs> yeah. Put you know some cayenne in it. Make it good and hot. Make it good because you want to, you want people to eat it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you want them to you get something enough to when they get done and the football comes on, they want to grab a beer. Once yeah. they grab a beer, all bets are off. Because they start drinking three or four beers, they're not going hunting that afternoon. <laughs> now you've just removed them completely from the situation. Man, that's a that's pressure advice I've never never heard. <laughs> I like it though. See, I thought you were gonna say yeah. put a lot of extra jalapenos in it. That way, uh, about four o'clock, they have to climb down out of the stand, and then <laughs> um, then they you know they stink up their hunting area, and then all the deer run to your spot. That's really what I thought you were going. I there. did too. And I guess that's option B. No, the, the strategy is is that. You know, you know. Usually about noon, one o'clock, everybody starts going. Where are you thinking about going this afternoon? That's the, yeah. That's where everybody. Where are you thinking about going? I'm like, my standard answer is, man, I'm gonna stay here and watch football. It ain't right where I want to hunt right now, and I'm just gonna sit in here and watch football. Mm-hmm. Really? <laughs> like, yeah, man. I mean, got some you know good games on. Let's just sit in here and watch football. So they all get fired up, start you know drinking beer and eating food and watching football. And then you just dip out and uh, <laughs> then go get stand and go roll one over. That's right, man. Uh, that's a that's an interesting strategy. That is interesting I'll, I'll for tell sure. Y'all, I'll tell y'all this is the honest truth. This is this is no exaggeration. I was not going to go to the camp. Uh, I guess it was the third weekend in January. I wasn't going to go. The conditions were crappy, and I was going to wait. Uh, it was uh, it was Friday afternoon. A bunch of guys were gonna, we were all gonna go. I said, man, it's not gonna be good. I don't want to go. And they, you know, all these guys kind of pulled that deal on me. It's like, yeah, we're not gonna go. And then Friday evening, you know, they all said, yeah, we're on the way. So they kind of gar hold me. Uh-huh. So, um, but the conditions still weren't right. I was gonna wait and go like Monday or or Tuesday, and um, and go when the conditions were good. So. Anyway, long story short, I didn't sleep at all. <laughs> I woke I woke up at uh, well, I didn't really sleep much. I finally just said, "Crap!" It's three hours from my house to our camp, so um, I got up at about two thirty. My stuff was already in the truck. I just went and got in the truck and drove from two thirty to the camp. I got there at five thirty. You should have seen the look on these guys' faces when I pulled in the driveway, <laughs> dressed, ready to hunt, had my bow. And they're like, crap, are you kidding me? I'm like, no, because they were all going to try to move into where I'd been hunting. And, uh, <laughs> and I went over there that, that morning and said, I'm just going to have to push it on this deer. I'm going to go get right on top of him. I mean, literally, I'm going to look over to where I know that little, little draw he's bedding in, and I'm going to get right on top of him. And I went in there and killed him that morning. Um, <laughs> it was a 151-inch Alabama buck. Dang, Golly, that's why? awesome. Yeah, so I left that tree in there, that stand in there, and then I thought, and I shot that deer like at 6.15, and I thought, okay, I got to be strategic about this. So I I took the the, the, the little buggy, that I, my bad boy buggy, I took that, I went all the way backtrack myself, and then I went up this property line all the way around to the other side of the property, and I sent one of the guys a text and said, hey, don't worry about picking up so-and-so. I'm right here behind him. I'll pick him up. <laughs> and so I came from the complete opposite direction of the of the farm where I actually killed that deer and came down that road to pick this guy up. So they all thought I was, you know, a mile to the west of where I was when, in, in essence, I was right behind our camp. And uh, But, I mean, that's the links you've got to go to <laughs> to guard hold people and kill big deer. And so yep. those jokers stayed. That I killed that deer Saturday morning. I literally packed packed up, drove back home, and uh, worked that weekend. They hunted all weekend, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, Thursday afternoon, I came up because the weather got good, and I went in Friday morning and killed that other buck, which was just as good. Uh, and they'd been there the whole week and hadn't killed anything. And I literally hunted two mornings and killed those two, but they were pissed. Golly. 
But they had spent the whole week while I was gone on the west end of the farm thinking that's where I killed that big deer. <laughs> and I killed them both up. right behind the house, you know. Yeah. Oh, that's they, awesome. <laughs> that's, a, that's another thing, you know, that uh, we don't get to hear a lot of sometimes. But there's a there's a different kind of hunting culture in the in the around deer camp in the south you know it's that's a somewhat normal kind of ribbon and pushing and pulling kind of thing for for deer camps around here man so i i totally get it dude i understand it yeah well i always tell my buddies i hunt with i'm i say guys look i'm never gonna lie to you but i'm never gonna tell you the truth about where i hunt <laughs> so <laughs> i mean you can't yeah you can't because i mean you 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 let somebody go in that hasn't put in the time and doesn't know what a mature deer's doing. Mm-hmm. They go in there one time and 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 alter his movement. The, those deer don't they don't move a hundred yards. They move to another property. Yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. Yeah. They you know, know the big deer are going to find those sanctuaries, and that's just that's just how it is. And they they don't they don't fall for the banana and the tailpipe twice. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, for if sure. it happens once, they're out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So you were talking about uh, shooting a trad bow uh, yeah. earlier. Is that something that, uh, w- like, when did you do that? And are you still in that uh, trad game? Or you, you what's oh, yeah. your what's your setup look like? Yeah. So uh, I, I I I shoot both. Um, I shoot a, a trad bow and a compound bow, and it really there's no rhyme to reason to when I do one or the other. Uh, if I had my druthers, I would shoot. Um, a trad bow all the time, but a trad bow is a pretty big commitment of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you really have to put the time into practice. And there's a lot of times when life gets in the way and, um, you know, there's, there, for instance, um, I have not taken a day off, uh, since, uh, June, I think June 20th. Mm-hmm. I think that's the last day I took off. I worked um, all through, you know, Fourth of July weekend. That that day, you know, I've got I've got my normal business, and then day six has just blown up. So it's around the clock. Well, I don't have time to shoot my boat, mm-hmm. so I'm not gonna, you know, be just because I'm a trad hunter in in air quotes feel like I have to do it. Uh, to maintain my image, I'm not going to take that trad bow hunting if I'm not, you know, dialed in with it and, and in tune with the bow. Cause it's just like throwing a baseball, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah. when I, when I'm out of practice and don't have the time, I grab a compound and, uh, uh, and that's what I do. And then when I have the time to commit to the trad bow and I'm really shooting well, I hunt with it. But so when I worked at that archery shop last year, I worked there, it was a hunting store. We had everything. But the last year I worked there, um, there was a, a, a customer that came in all the time that was a prison warden. And that prison warden um, came in one day and he had a, a trustee with him. He always had a trustee drive him around. And this guy was from Montana and he was a custom uh, bow maker, a boyer. Huh. And um, and he had had a, a, a unfortunate accident and and that somebody had died in a drinking and driving accident and he had to spend some time. And so, um, when he got there and he had his interview with my friend, the warden, he said, Hey, I, you know, this is what I do. I see you like to hunt. And the guy immediately, you know, made him a trustee. They had a wood shop there and, and they were building recurves there. And that would have been in 90, that would have been in 90, uh, 92, 93, something like that. And so I went out to the prison and uh, made my first bow with that guy, and uh, I still got it. That's and, cool. Um, yeah, and and we started hunting with it. And then a bunch of my buddies started doing it, and uh, it was really weird because we were like 23, 24-year-old guys, three or four of us that hunted together a lot, all hunting with trad bows. And we were getting it done. I mean, you know, elk, bear, moose, mm-hmm. uh, caribou, that's all the stuff I was, you know, going after. And then lots of deer and hogs. And, um, you know, it was just, it, it didn't, it wasn't a thing to us. It wasn't like this, like, trendy um, kind of thing. Trendy thing like it is now. It yep. wasn't this, you know, oh, you shoot a trad bow. Um, it was just what we did. It wasn't this, this, this special thing at all. And so, 
uh, it was just second nature to us. And, mm-hmm. and I did it for years and, and I guess it would have been after I had my accident in 13, um, I didn't have a lot of time to shoot and didn't have the ability to shoot, of course. And I got, I got another, uh, compound bow and started shooting those again, I guess back then. And, uh, I was like, man, this is this is like a laser beam. I, I, <laughs> things have changed, you yeah. know. And so, um, so I guess six months after my accident, or seven months after my accident, a good friend of mine, he he, he really knew I was struggling. Um, you know, being bedridden and not being able to walk and not be able to get around, and for that, I mean, it just it really works on you. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I'm a very active person, high energy always outside and, and being restricted like that was just like being in prison. So he really knew I was struggling. And, and he said, Hey man, you know, we, we didn't get to celebrate your birthday. You turning 40 cause you were kind of, kind of mopped all that up uh, by letting the building fall on you. But, um, <laughs> why don't we go over to Africa? Because, you know, literally they can drive you right up to a blind. You can hobble in a blind and, I know you can get where you can shoot. And uh, he says, why don't we go over there like in September since we're not going to be able to go elk hunting. I said, man, I, I, I'd love to do that. So that's what we did. And I'd been over there before. And so I called the guy and that's his slow time of year. And he's like, yeah, man. And we had kept in touch. He knew what had happened to me. And he's like, yeah, come on. I'm take care of you guys. And so, um, so we went over there and I took my nephew and I took another guy and we actually made a film out of that hunt. Um, uh, it's called Lost Arrow Africa. It's on, um, YouTube and all that stuff. But that was back then. And I guess 2013, but I was going to carry a compound because I hadn't shot, you know, Mm -hmm. and about two or three weeks before that hunt, I grabbed one of my longbows or no, I grabbed one of my recurves. Yeah. And it was a, a 58 pound Morrison. Yeah. Yeah. 58 pound Morrison Cheyenne. And I started shooting that thing and man, it just felt good. (laughs) Lights out. I mean, I was shooting great. I'm like, because the the other times I'd been there, I'd only taken a trad bow. I'd never taken anything but a longbow or recurve to Africa. So I said, man, I'm not going to, I'm taking this thing. And so I went over there with that trad bow (laughs) and uh, we had an incredible hunt and and made a, a really cool film. And, uh, and, uh, that was just, you know, no, I mean, no matter what shape I was in, I always wanted, I always wanted to grab that trad bow first. And that's kind of still where I'm at now, but mm-hmm. I don't want to be an unethical hunter either. Right. Just grab it and go when I hadn't shot in three weeks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's not, that's just not, it's not worth being able to say you're a diehard trad hunter. Uh, if you're not going to, you know, have the ability to put in the time to do it right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, makes sense, man. I, I kind of look forward to going and watching that film now that you talked about it like mm-hmm. that. That's pretty cool. Uh, but uh, so through all that, why did you decide to hop into the archery products business like you have with Day 6? Well, I kind of I kind of got tricked into it. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, the, 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 the arrow shafts, uh, uh, the original concept and design – uh, was, um, uh, born over in Australia. Um, and it was, uh, Zelor arrows. And, um, a friend of mine, uh, owned the company. And the first time I got my hands on them, I was like, this is what I have wanted. This is what I've been looking for. I am so tired of bending these FMJs, but those are the only arrows I can get with the diameter I want and the weight per inch um that i want this is the arrow i want but they didn't have very good components on the end so i got a bunch of shafts from him over there and brought them back and um and had some you know local guys that are in the machine machining business i had them make me some you know outsert collars (coughs) the way i wanted them and uh and i shot those things for a while then my buddies were like man you got to get me some of those arrows. So, you know, I'm calling my buddy in Australia. He's kind of half ass running it, or I'm sorry, halfway running it and, um, not really pushing it. And, um, 
So he's sending them to me when he can and all. And then he's like, man, why don't you help me with this company and you be, well, let's be partners and you run out, you run the, the United States and I'll run Australia and we'll get this thing going. And, um, and I said, well, man, I'd be interested in that. I've, I've got a broadhead design that I've kind of cobbled up and, and been shooting since 13 or 14, uh, kind of a hybrid that I built. I'd like to produce that too. And it would just make sense having these arrows and all. I said, but we got to change the name. I mean, Zelor is the worst name I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Isn't awful, that from Dude, you know? Where's My Car or something like that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, you, you, you remember that episode of Seinfeld? And they were they named that uh, that water Molen Springs. <laughs> and they're like, Molen Springs? That is awful, you know? But, uh, but anyway, I was like, this is just we got to change it. And he's like, well, let's, let's start brainstorming. So I'm brainstorming and, and I came up with this and, and, uh, and we're like in the final hour. I mean, I've already gone through all the prototyping with the new component system over here in the States with AAE. Um, we've got everything done. I have, uh, secured a new factory, uh, to produce the arrows to the quality we wanted versus the other factory I didn't like. So we had everything in place, and he's like, hey, man, I'm going to go into the kangaroo jerky business. Uh, <laughs> why don't you just buy z and this company's yours? Well, heck, I had so much time and money invested in that point. You know, he kind of gar me into the deal, and, <laughs> and so I was like, heck, yeah, I guess so. So that's how it got going. And then – and I was getting prodded also by Aaron, you know, Snyder. He, he was hunting with me. He's like, man, I really like those arrows, and – um, I think if you bring them here, you'll do real well with them. And, and, uh, you, you should do this, man. You should do it. This is just, it's just, it's too good of a, a complete package for people not to have it offered because before, you know, you could buy a decent arrow shaft, but then you had to go buy a component from somebody else. If you wanted a really beefy component, so you couldn't get it all in one place, you know? And then, most of the arrows came with like real crappy fletchings. So, you know, you pretty much had to custom build everything. So we thought, man, let's just do the best knock, the best fletchings, the best shaft, the best component system. And then, you know, try to get this broadhead developed and basically have the complete hunting arrow all in one spot where you can just pick it up, get it and done. And you don't have to, you know, go to three, four different parties and cobble it together. So that's how it started. And, and, uh, you know, we hit our, our, we hit what I considered my one year goal in the first 90 days. Oh, wow. Wow. And I knew I was in deep trouble (laughs) Um, because, you know, I have a construction company that, that I've run for a long time. And I mean, we're in an incredible market where we live. Um, we have an incredible economy right now. We're busier than we've ever been. Mm-hmm. And this arrow company and the broadheads are coming online at the same time. All this is kind of happening. And I'm going, man, this, this I'm in trouble because <laughs> this thing is cranking. <laughs> so, like I said, it is seven days a week right now, you know, 12, 14 hour days. I mean, yeah. there's there's no other way around it because, I mean, I, 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 I at this point, I can't trust the product to go out from somebody else's hand. I, yeah. I have, have my hand and my eye on it right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. so where the, where day six come from? I mean, was well, the sixth day of creation. I gotcha. So I was wondering when, that, man, that's awesome. Yeah. That's when God created uh, the animals of the earth and it's when he created man. So, yeah. Um, I just thought that was, uh, you know, fitting. Yeah. It's cool. cool. I just, uh, wrapped up a big Genesis study. So that's, that was kind of on top of mind whenever I, I saw the name, but that's very cool, man. So, you, when did you start like the broadhead, like mm-hmm. AutoCAD or whatever? Has that been way before the the eras? I've always kind of built my own stuff and loved playing with it and and you know making things. And so, uh, and I and I've always been the guy that likes the obscure stuff that nobody has. Yeah. Um, like you know, like my boots that I always wear when I'm whitetail hunting are from Ireland. Uh, 
unfortunately i've had one pair 15 years nobody had ever seen them they were they're they're awesome boots i still have have these unfortunately they've become extremely popular a- among women now <laughs> and leprechauns so, too probably right <laughs> yeah. yeah and so all of these like fancy women wear like my knee my knee boots that i hunt in <laughs> around town now and so i catch holy hell over that at the camp um but I've had these things for 15 years or longer before these women started wearing them, and I'm sticking to that. Yeah. So, and I have things to prove it That's before good. there was ever even a North American distributor. Um, <laughs> now the little frou-frou stores downtown have them in the window. Well, it's so. good, though. Now there's like a steady supply. You know, maybe it's, like the cost will go down, and you'll have hunt boots forever. You and the ladies. Embar- <laughs> it's just embarrassing, man. <laughs> but anyway, I've always liked, you know, obscure stuff, and, and I love researching and finding, like, the very best thing on the planet to use. <laughs> I, I wanted a certain boot. I could not find it. I researched, 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 found these things in Ireland. Basically had to get them to ship them to Canada because they wouldn't ship them to me. Huh. But they did ship somewhere in Canada, ship them to Canada, had a buddy of mine go pick them up, box them, ship them to me. It was a total goat roping. <laughs> and so I went ahead and bought two pair uh, because I knew I didn't want to go through that again. And they're extremely expensive, but it's what I wanted. And I've had that. I've had those two pair of boots and I've worn, I wear one pair in the morning, one pair in the afternoon. That's how I hunt with them. And so that way, if they get wet, I'm not wearing them wet. Huh. Yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, one pair in the morning, one pair in the afternoon. I bought those in uh, 2003, so they're 16 years old. All I do is clean them and oil them every year. Neither one has leaked. Man, that's cool. Yeah, that's pretty yeah, absolutely. Neat. I mean, they're just amazing. But anyway, I love that kind of stuff. So when I was getting ready to go to Africa in 13, like we talked about, keep in mind that from February to basically July, I'd been in a bed. So I can tell you everything going on the internet in every country in every language because all I could do was goof around on the computer and Mm. scream at people on the phone. So, (laughs) um, for my business. So I found these broadheads in Hungary and I really loved the shape. Uh, I loved the blade angle. I loved everything about them. Wasn't crazy about the feral and I wasn't crazy about the fact that they were vented. And that the vent went all the way to the back corner and created a weak point. Mm -hmm. But I went ahead and ordered a bunch of them. So there I am laying in, laying in bed, um, looking at these things thinking, eh, I don't think they're very good. So I just kind of pushed them off to the side. So in the interim, from the time I ordered those first set of heads, the guy over in Hungary had developed another head. And so when we went to Africa, there's, you know, other people in camp, a lot of Europeans often. There was a guy from Hungary in camp bow hunting with a compound, and he had the new version of these heads. And I'm like, that's way closer. So I actually got a couple off that guy, played with them, came back, um, took that blade, found his, you know, went and just aggravated the crap out of every blade manufacturer on the planet uh, until I finally got... Um, uh, this company to respond to me on madeinchina.com. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is the truth. And so I sent, a picture, I sent them a picture of this blade and said, um, you know, can you build this blade but build it solid? And they said, yes, please send us one. We can build them for you. And I said, okay. So I sent the first one. It comes back because you can't send any kind of like sharp instrument, blade, anything to China. Mm. Now they can ship all that stuff to us, but we can't ship any of that stuff to them. Right. Okay. So this goes on and on and on. And so finally I got one of the blades and stuck it inside of a piece of foam, taped it up, mailed it and it got through. (laughs) So, um, but before I did, I ground like the edges flat on the blade. So it wouldn't be a sharp object. So Mm -hmm. maybe it would be, you know, get, get by. Well, anyway, they called back and said, we can build them for this amount of money out of this steel. Uh, the minimum order quantity is 5000 I went, <laughs> whoa, I need like 50. Yeah. <laughs> and so this goes back and forth. And so finally, um, they uh, agreed to do a, 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 a 200 blade run, sample run 
they charged me twice as much for them, but I went ahead and did it and had these solid blades made and then brought those back, put them in the ferrules from the ones I bought in Hungary, and that's what I hunted with for a while. And that's the head that I always wanted. Um, and nobody ever made it. They just, nobody ever did it. I mean, it's nothing groundbreaking, but it's the shape, the size. It was everything I wanted. Um, and so anyway, long story short, I had these things drawn up and, and, uh, and we put them into production, you know, to go along with the arrows and, and they released in May. Yeah. What are we in now? July? Uh, August, just turned now. August actually. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I finally, it took me a year to get the, the broadheads done. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, crazy. anyway, that's kind of the, the genesis of, of how it all came. It's funny. I kept all these old heads and the originals and all that. I kept all this stuff so I could, you know, go back and, and, and build a timeline on how this head came to be. Um, so it's, it's pretty neat, you know? Yeah. 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 That's cool, man. So, you know, kind of the thing behind the heads, I actually ordered uh, arrows and a couple broadheads from you here while back. So, uh, and that's probably what I'm going to be shooting. Uh, I'm going to mix mix up the broadheads, but, you know, I'm going to be shooting your arrows. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the concept is a heavier, more durable arrow. Because I talked to you on the phone here while back and told you that I just broke way more arrows last year when I thought I ought to. But I'm trying to get, you know, a heavier arrow, and it's hard to do with carbon. I don't want to do FMJs like you were talking about earlier. But the whole kicker is, what's it going to do when it actually slows down my bow that much? Right? right. So, And that's what everybody's worried about, including me. But uh, smart guys like you can kind of give me a little confidence to think that it's going to be okay. Right? Because people kill stuff with trad bows, and those are way slower. So <laughs> what are going to be some of the things that happen when you strap, like, a, a heavier arrow on your bow? And, well, before we get there, why don't you tell yeah. me, why day six arrows are heavier and like how much heavier they are and like what what's ideal yeah they're not that much heavier yeah. um so let's say that that uh your average 300 is eight grains per inch you know ours are 11 so what are they 25 percent heavier mm-hmm. so what i'm trying to do is is i am trying to distribute the weight um throughout the shaft a little more than, than up front where a lot of people try to accomplish all their weight in the front end of the arrow with, you know, outserts, weighted inserts, heavy broadheads. I would have rather have it a little more distributed, um, uh, and have just a moderate, uh, front of center weight and, and, and have a little bit more balanced arrow because I, I, I found over the years, uh, through some failures that having a more balanced arrow, uh, is a little better for penetration once variables are introduced. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're shooting in a vacuum, a 600 grain arrow is a 600 grain arrow. Uh, the target, whatever it is, does not know and nor care how much weight of, of it's in the front, the back, the middle. It's flying the same at 600 grains. It's going to penetrate the same. Mm-hmm. So, um, and that's not me. That's smart people that send rockets in space. So, <laughs> um, so but what happens is, is when you put a lot of weight up front and then you get in variables introduced, whether that be a crosswind, an updraft, uh, a limb, a branch, something on the way, and it kicks off, um, it, 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 that point will continue on target. That is 100% a fact, a fact, but it'll fly at an angle because the back end's so light, it'll, it'll be fl- flying at an angle, whatever the, the downwind side is. And just because it hits where you're aiming, does it, that does not translate to penetration because if the knock is not behind the head and that, and that force is not going focused straight through, that's where you lose your penetration. So first and foremost, I am not a ultra heavy arrow proponent. What I'm a proponent of is excellent arrow flight. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm pushing. And for the average guy, to get extra, uh, to get exceptional arrow flight, he has to slow his arrow down, add a little weight to it, make it a little more stable. You know, it's basically shoot a station wagon instead of a Ferrari, okay? It's going to get there. 
and it's going to run you over, and it's going to hurt a lot more. Um, <laughs> they both so, get you to Wally World, right? <laughs> they'll both get you to Wally World, and you'd much rather be run over by a Ferrari than you would a, a station wagon. So yeah. it's like, it's like, well, I'd rather you kick me in the face with a with a soccer ball or throw a bowling ball at me. I'll take the soccer ball all day. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, but to get the good aero flight, you know you've got to take into consideration that bows are always changing. No matter if it's tuned today, a month from now, it may not be tuned. Everything's moving, changing, adjusting, stretching. And if you're shooting an ultralight, ultra fast system, uh, that ultralight arrow, if it's flying true, it, it will penetrate and it'll do a job. Is it going to do what a heavy arrow is going to do? No, because, you're trying to get momentum for penetration, not um, kinetic energy. And that's where a big misconception is. So, so a, a heavier arrow that's a little slower is going to be more stable. It's going to be easier to tune. It's going to, it's going to fly better and keep the knot behind the head. Um, it's also going to absorb the energy from your bow more efficiently. So, Let's say that you shoot an arrow that's 10% heavier. Well, you don't lose 10% in speed. You just lose a few percent in speed. But what and the reason is, is because let's say that you're shooting a 70-pound bow, 30-inch draw, which is basically IBO. And let's say that the most efficient setup uh, for that bow is going to be 8 grains per pound. That's a 560-grain arrow, 7 times 8. Five, six. So that means that when you shoot that bow, the majority of the energy that that bow is generating is getting transferred into the arrow efficiently. Mm -hmm. Now, when you drop that that weight 100 grains and now you're shooting a 460 grain arrow, now you're going to put 80 percent of that energy into the arrow and 20 percent of it's going to go back into the bow in the form of vibration, noise, so on and so forth. So it's almost like finding the right gear for your car or the right prop for your boat. Um, that car has a fixed amount of horsepower. That boat engine has a fixed amount of horsepower. And you're trying to find that right gear or prop to utilize that fixed amount of horsepower for the optimum performance. Um, it's the same thing that you're doing with your arrow. So if you shoot a super light arrow, you're wasting energy back into the bow and then when you shoot a super heavy arrow you're doing the same thing you're putting the energy back in the bow in the form of stress because it's breaking the bow down um so um so you're trying to find that sweet spot okay so mm -hmm. it'd be like um you know uh uh, uh say take a take a, a dragster that's got a thousand horsepower well that that if that dragster weighs three thousand pounds it's super light, super squirrely, and you can't control it. At 4,000 pounds, it's pretty stable. You can keep it going straight, and it's utilizing the energy really well, and you're, you know, you're getting the best time to the, to the finish line. And then if you made it 5,000 pounds, it's a dog. It's too heavy because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, you're bogging the engine down. It's the mm -hmm. same thing. The bow's your engine. So, um, so that's what I'm trying to create here is a little slower, more stable aero system that is using the energy from the bow the most efficiently. And you're doing that through weight. So That's the only thing you can control. It's the only variable you can control. Pretty much, from what I'm understanding, is there's a perfect spot that you want yep. to be at. And you've got, so take two wave frequencies, right? And you've got your bow is one of the waves and your arrow is one of the other waves. And there's a certain point where both of those waves are going to peak out at the same exact spot, and that's going to be the most efficient spot for your bow and arrow combination. That's what you're trying to hit with your arrow weight. That's right. That's right. Gotcha. Yeah. So and it's, not that you, it's not that you can't get good flight with a light arrow, uh -huh. and it's not that you can't get good flight with a heavier. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, is that you're on either ends of the spectrum, and you're not using the, the weight – of, you know, the energy from your bow efficiently. So when you, when you have a super light arrow flying true and, and flying great, um, 
it's it's an effective weapon. I'm not saying that it's not, and it's the same thing with that super super heavy arrow. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is though is that when you go to the super light super fast arrow, and you've got it perfectly tuned, and then you put your broadhead on the front, and it's you know, uh, say, ten percent faster than um, uh, than say a, a moderately weighted arrow, kind of like what we're doing, you know. Well, it's not the same thing like it is with losing speed when you're changing the weight with regards to planing. So now you've got two things working against you. You've increased the speed, which is means you're increasing the wind force on your broadhead that you're strapped onto the front of this arrow. Mm-hmm. And you're reducing the weight of the arrow. So it is it is doesn't have the mass to stabilize that flight. So you're increasing the force on your planing surface and you're reducing the, the mass of the arrow that can, that can counteract that. So by reducing the speed and increasing the weight, you're picking up two factors there that are going to improve your arrow flight with a broadhead. Mm-hmm. I really don't care how your arrows fly with a field tip. Not my pig, not my farm. <laughs> I really don't care. I don't really care what your pin gaps are for tack. You know, shooting the total archery challenge. Uh-huh. I don't really care. What I care about is, is that when you have an elk standing out there, and it's the one chance you're going to get out of five hunts uh, of going elk hunting, that when you release that arrow, that it is stable, it's flying true, and it's going to be stuck in the ground on the other side after it goes through it. Oof. That's the only thing. I, that's the only thing. Day six is focused on is successful hunts. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I'm fired up now. I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's awesome, man. And, and I I believe what you're saying, and this is after a couple conversations and my own research and stuff, but it, it makes sense to me. It's, uh, it's a logical approach to something that we, uh, you know, as archers really try to make more complex than what it really should be. That's it. That's it. It's, 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 speed is not always the greatest thing. It, it, it's really not. And, and I've learned that the hard way myself over the years, you know, before I went to a trad bow, you know, I was shooting a, um, an Alpine Silverado, uh, uh, one of the first machined aluminum risers I ever saw, uh, all before, but back then it was all magnesium risers, you know, cast or wood. Uh, mm-hmm. Browning was still making wood risers back then. But anyway, I shot an Alpine Silverado, um, 84 pounds, Ooh. Uh, I was drawing 29 and a half inches uh, and drawing way back to below my ear because I, I wanted a longer draw length to get more speed mm-hmm. and more energy. And um, so, you know, and I went through all the, the struggles trying to get good air flight, you know, with those kind of systems. And I shot high poundage for years. And then, you know, I stumbled across this 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 wonderful art of uh, traditional bow hunting. And I watched this, you know, slow boat to China arrow just zip through deer like butter. And it was going sometimes, you know, almost half the speed of what my compounds were shooting. And I'm going, hey, (laughs) dum-dum. You know, you you may not have finished your engineering degree, but you don't really need it to understand what's going on here. Mm -hmm. The arrow is heavy. It's flying true. It's got a cut on contact head and it's zipping through everything. Take this same formula, put it in front of some energy with a compound bow and you own everything that walks. Mm-hmm. Oof. And so that's, you know, that was basically the whole premise behind, you know, the, you know, me having kind of an epiphany, if you will, was behind that trad bow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's why I've stuck with it so long is I almost feel like I owe traditional archery uh, an incredible debt um, because it just it increased my learning curve and my awareness as far as how to be a really efficient killer with a bow. Um, that would have taken years and years and lots of failures to figure out on my own. And, um, and so I, I think I just almost feel beholden to it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah for sure man well i think that uh it's cool how you can take something that's been done for so long like traditional archery is called traditional archery for a reason and then take those concepts apply them to new technology and just make it that much more lethal 
And uh, I'm looking forward to two holes this year. I want, <laughs> I want, I said, that is my goal after this year. I want pass throughs, man. I want to see two holes and animals. And uh, I'm looking forward. Yeah, to well, you're pulling the drain plug out on that second hole, man. That's right, man. That's, that's right. all it is. It's the drain plug. You're pulling it out, and it's going to drain. I mean, that's what you're looking for. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're never going to get a tub to em- empty out until you pull the hole at the bottom out. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right, man. And you just talk about shooting, you know, if you're hunting from a tree stand. Uh, oh, you, if you're shooting down on an animal, you know, a 15 yard shot or something, you're putting a hole in the top third of that deer. And how's it going to bleed out that you're going to, what's going to happen is your deer's going to crash a hundred yards away. And it's going to take you three hours to find him, you know? So yeah, anyways. I'll, t- I'll tell you, I'll tell you a good, a, a good a- anecdote, uh, hunting related to that. Um, uh, my, my buddy that I went to, that, that encouraged me to get out of bed and go to Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he and I were elk hunting together uh the year before i got hurt and or maybe two years before i can't remember anything anymore but anyway (laughs) um but we 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 uh i had killed a really good bull and uh in the process of uh and this is not the same story i told you this was totally different but i in the process of, (laughs) of of hunting that bull i found a wallow and so uh we went and put a tree stand on that wallow and uh um and he hunted, uh, I guess it was probably four or five days later, he was on that wallow one afternoon, and he killed a eight-by-eight. Eight. Oh, my. Uh, we call, we called him Ocho Ocho. Mm. Um, killed a really nice eight-by-eight eight bull. Um, old bull, rounded off point. Just a really neat character bull. Yeah. That bull came in, and he shot that thing straight down at like 10 yards, seven, eight yards maybe, right under his tree. And he was basically almost quartering hard away. He shot down. He shot him good, right beside the spine, straight down in the chest cavity, but it didn't come out. And that bull ran, and there was no blood. Yeah. Because the the entry hole was all the way at the top of the back, like almost like three inches to the right of the spine. Mm-hmm. So there was literally no blood. I mean, it was the most difficult track job I think I've ever done. We tracked that bull till about, I don't know, nine or ten well, probably a little bit later now, 11 or 12 at night. But he didn't get dark till like 9. And we pulled out of there because we just, you know, we had to have daylight to try to find him. Yeah. And so the next day we uh, got back on that track and we found that bull, his track. And every three, 400 yards, we would find what we think was a speck, a dried speck. Uh, it was tough. And it was getting depressing, and we lost him on this trail on the side of this ridge, and so back and forth, back and forth. And so I went back and just slowly walked this this edge of this ridge, and I saw where an animal had turned off the trail and went straight down the canyon, straight down the ridge, basically slid. And I told him, I said, man, this is – I don't want to go down in that hill hole because I really almost don't want to find your bull out of it down there. <laughs> yeah. Carry him out. yeah. But, but we've got to find, we've got to follow these sliding tracks and they're fresh and, and, you know, and we'll know when we get to the bottom, if this is your bull, because when he turns to go up the other side, as steep as it is, the, the blood should come out the top. And so we slid down that, the, the face of that thing, I don't know how far down that it was sketchy, sketchy. <laughs> and we got down to the bottom, hit the creek, saw a wet track, three to four steps, uh, strides of that bull up the other face of the canyon going up. He started bleeding. Mm. And cause he got on an angle where it was pushing blood. And the bull was almost going straight up and it yeah. was it, it blood for it to be able to come out and he was bleeding good. And, uh, he went up over the next ridge and we found him, but, Golly. And we found him at two o'clock the next day. Oh wow! And um, and we could still move his head. So he oh. had only been dead an hour or so. Wow, man. Yeah, but that was uh, but that was right then and there. I had been arguing with him and some of the other guys about heavy arrows, light arrows, mm-hmm. expandable heads, cut on contact heads. And right there, I said, you know, when we when we found that bull, the arrow was still in him, mm. and. And we, uh, when we cut him open, if, if he would have had three more inches of penetration, he would have breached the brisket 
are right behind the brisket and uh, in, in the belly and the chest there, like where the kind of where the chest here and the belly here meet. Yeah. And um, it would have been a cakewalk to find that bull. Hmm. Mm hmm. You know, but but that and that would have been the difference if you'd have been shooting a heavier arrow and a, and a cut on contact head instead of an expandable. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, man. And, and y'all are just blessed to find that bull. Honestly, you know, just you're good tracking. I mean, that could have just been a deal where you lost the bull and he died. You know, it's crazy. Well, but. it wasn't just me. I mean, he's as good a tracker as yeah, I am. Sure. I, I didn't want to make. I, I I hope I didn't make it sound like I was leading the charge there. I mean, we were both <laughs> tracking that thing and. Um, so anyway, no, we, we, uh, we found that bull together and then fortunately we had, uh, I had the one thing I did carry with me with other than my knives and my kill kit is I carried my sat phone and there were some boys in camp down the road. Uh, and I called them up and gave them my coordinates and said, guys, you know, we helped y'all carry. Here's where we're at. <laughs> uh, we didn't ever got that bull out of there. And so, you know, three other guys came and we were able to split that bull up uh, five ways. And, and, and we, you know, hands and knees crawled up the face of that, Ooh, that mm. you know, face of that, that, that um, canyon to get out and get to the top. Yep. That's, that's good enough reason right there to go ahead and just get him killed quick with a heavy arrow. <laughs> Cause I don't want to deal with that. So, well, I'm going to give him a shot this year, man. I'm kind of excited about it. I'm going to try to put one through a, a Gila monster over in New Mexico. So, uh, looking well, forward to it. Well, I hope you it. do. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate it. I, I, uh, I'm, uh, You're going to the right spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just hopefully I'm the right guy. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Well, is there anything, any, uh, any more cool stuff coming down the pot for day six, or are you done innovating and you're just going to sell stuff now? No, no, I can't stop. Um, <laughs> No, we're we're gonna try to release uh, something new every year. That cool. that is my goal, uh, and I I usually uh, uh, really go overboard sticking to what I say I'm gonna do. So yeah, uh, the arrows were the first release. The broadheads were this year for 19, 2020. We've got something uh, that's not arrow and broadhead related, but is archery related. That's gonna be, uh, I, I think it's gonna be pretty big. Um, but I may be wrong, um, but uh, so that we're going to have that. And then I've got some other smaller things that we're working on that I may filter in here and there. I've got a, a really cool, uh, like, knife tool type thing that we're, we've designed and um, just some other small stuff. But the big launch will be 20 will be a, another pretty big product. Sweet. Well, looking forward to that, man. If people mm -hmm. want to go and see uh, what you've got to offer and whatnot, where should we send them? Well, I've got a website, um, Day Six Gear, and then uh, our Instagram is Day Six Gear. Uh, I am not the best Insta Google tweet facer, <laughs> but um, but I try to put something on there every two or three days. I cannot wait for hunting season because if I have to put one more artsy product picture up, I am going to go berserk. I want <laughs> to see some animals. Uh, I'm right there with you, dude. Tyler yeah. and I were shooting yesterday, and he said, I cannot wait to stop shooting rubber and <laughs> actually shoot something legit. And we no. just can't wait, man. I'm so glad that elk season is in September because if we had to wait till October, I don't think I could make it. <laughs> no. Did you say you were hunting the first or the second half? Second season, so it's going to be the first. 15? 14th through the 24th of September. Yeah, well, well, man, we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to rally up and have lunch uh, before you go into the mountain because I'll be I'm right next to you out there and I'll be there the same dates. Awesome, so, let's do it, brother. Uh, that sounds cool. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure. Gonna, I'm gonna go out uh, probably a little early. Yeah, um, and and do some scouting. Um, my my uh, a, a buddy of mine's coming down. He's hunting in wyoming and then he's going to drive straight from there uh to meet me and so i'm going to kind of have us try to have us teed up yeah bad at the bone um, dude that sounds cool you know uh, since you've been out there so much you can show me where all the the good mexican food restaurants are out there because uh i mean we're gonna kill and pack out on day three so we're gonna have a whole lot of mexican <laughs> food to eat once we get back you know so. <laughs> yeah well i don't i don't know that the the word good and and restaurants were usually collide in the same sense in that part of the world but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but i can tell you where the restaurants are good good's <laughs> relative you know good good and gooder uh so <laughs> yeah i mean it, I, I promise you the food network's not making a a, a normal trip through that part of the country yeah but, um, <laughs> there's no guy fieri gila episodes i don't guess but. <laughs> no no there's a couple of really cool places though but um 
but other, but uh, I, I will show you where I killed elk in there. And oh, see, and, that actually is more valuable than the Tex Mex. So <laughs> believe it or not, so yeah. that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? One of the things that you really need to do, um, and, and I'm embarrassed that I have not kept up with this, but where we're hunting, we don't have this opportunity. But where you're hunting, um, you need to look at the regulations uh, on the trout. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have the Gila trout and yep. I know that they were protected at one time. Uh, and I don't think that they're doing any other introduction as far as the fish in some of those rivers there, but, but you should look into that because, um, you know, years ago when I was hunting in there, uh, you know, we were fishing pretty regularly and, uh, uh, you know, midday, um, you know, I had this, this little tiny pack rod, um, a little tiny pack rod with little flies and all. And literally you could, you could have you, if it's, I don't know if it's still legal or if you can't, I think you can fish something out there, but yeah, there's fish there and you can literally have trout for dinner every night oh over my. a fire. Oh my goodness, dude. It's a game changer having real food versus the crap in the bags. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. And, yeah. um, so, I mean, I, I would, Really look into those regulations and Ooh. see if it's if the fishing's open. My goosebumps got goosebumps on that one. Then. So <laughs> something that you and I haven't talked much about is Tyler and I both are native trout junkies. Like it's a yeah. thing we love to do. We actually went to Arizona in 2016 <clears throat> and went and caught the Apache trout, which is the cousin of the Gila trout. And yep. so like when I drew the Gila tag, don't worry, I was scouting map scouting elk. But I also was just like looking at those New Mexico like uh, streams of where the Gila's were because that's on my list, man. So that makes me excited. Yeah. You know, I can only ca- not only catch one but eat one in the wilderness. It's gonna be pretty sweet. Yeah, I, you know what? I mean, having having real protein, um, having real protein uh, is a game changer for like uh, your energy and hunting and all that good yeah. stuff. Uh, it is. I mean, it, it's the difference in having a good hunt and, and a mediocre hunt. If you if your if your body's clipping along like it should, and man, if you've got that great, you know, that great food in you, man, it's just, uh, shoo. I mean, it's just a game changer. I, mm-hmm. I would, uh, um, I was going to send you guys something here while I was talking to you, but anyway, the, <laughs> the, um, but but I would I would look at those regulations because I do know that it was closed at one time. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, for for catching those things. And uh, here I'm sending y'all a picture now that y'all can uh, laugh at on uh, why you got me on the line so these people can hear you All laugh. Right, at yeah. me. I love to laugh. It's my if you can't tell, it's my favorite things to do. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm a brook, I'm a brook trout junkie, which everybody oh. says why do you why do you catch why do you catch bait? Yeah, um, it's down here. Our bait bigger than that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I just I just text you a uh, to this number you call I guess that's a cell phone you yeah, call it's me myself. From. yeah yeah I just text you a brook trout picture so y'all can laugh at my little brook trout Ooh, what's Ooh. a toad man is that from Canada <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah golly that's not what they look like in the Smokies at all <laughs> <laughs> no oh, gosh. Yeah, that's yeah. cool, man. Well, yeah, it sounds like we've got more adventures to talk about in the future, so we're probably going to have to have you back on. Since we're running on about two hours now, and I think oh, we could probably it? talk. Yeah, so <laughs> sorry we took so much time of your day, but uh, we could probably talk. If you want to just do a weekly episode with us, it'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I'm kidding. But uh, no, man, thank you so much for talking to us, mm-hmm. and uh, thanks, I, you know, thanks for being willing to become a friend. I feel like we've got a friend in you, man. So I really appreciate that. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, look forward to being in that area in New Mexico at the same time, man. I, uh, it's nothing like the camaraderie of deer camp, something we kind of started out talking about on this episode. And social media, as bad as it can be sometimes, is pretty cool when you use it the right way. And I think that something that's neat about the, um, the culture we're in now is that there's, if you let it, there's a big deer camp vibe that goes on where... Around September, everybody's just talking about elk hunting and so excited about it. And you can, like, I've got a buddy who hunts in, in southern Colorado every year, and I haven't seen this guy in a year, but uh, we talk about it all the time, right? And there's, like, this bigger camp vibe going on, and it's super cool. So it, it'll be cool to get there and kind of share the same part of the country and kind of wish each other luck, man. So uh, thanks I'm for that. I'm all for it. Yeah. Awesome, Sounds dude. Good. Well, we'll uh, we're definitely linked to day six in the notes here, so if the listener wants to check 
check out the arrows, the broadheads, that kind of thing, feel free to click down below. Brian, we appreciate it, man, and I'm sure we'll be talking to you a bunch this summer. You bet. All right, man. See ya. That was a lot of fun, man. I know it. It's <laughs> crazy how when uh, a couple guys get together who just uh, kind of have similar backgrounds and can just talk about all the things we enjoy in life. Yeah, man. for sure. Um, it's cool that he's been uh, hunted those parts of Texas that he was talking about, man. Yeah. I yeah. mean, like even me as a Texas and have, haven't hunted out some of the places he's hunted, which, uh, you know, we've had people talk about it. It's uh, Texas is like its own country. I mean, it's pretty large, so <laughs> you can't hunt at all, and, you know, especially with as much private as we have. Like it's uh, it's difficult to get out and get everywhere, but, but uh, hopefully one day I'll draw some – some of the different hunts across the state and, and be able to be a little more uh, uh, knowledgeable about uh, what's going on in different areas. But more than anything, just to, to grab that experience, man, and and uh, have that as a memory. Because, I don't know, Texas has a, has a lot of cool different uh, heritage, I feel like. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think I've talked to you about this before, but, like, um, there are a few things that are just, like, a Texan thing to do, you know? Mm-hmm. And... Um, and I haven't, there are a few things that I haven't actually been able to do. So it's almost like, I mean, I know I'm a Texan, but I, like, am I fully Texan if I don't, haven't done that one thing that like all these outdoorsmen are doing or whatever, you know? Yeah. So is that a uh, go shoot access during the summer? Cause it's a popular thing to do right well, now. Well, I would like to do that. That's for sure. Uh, but that, that was thinking more of like the lower Laguna Monterey fishing. Uh, oh, I've really. done that. It's awesome. You should yeah. do that. I know. That's all yeah. I hear. It's yeah. awesome. But I just, it's a long way. So I mean, I could. I could go to, you know, Iowa and scout for by the time I get down mm. there pretty much. But. Yeah, and it'd be way cooler in Iowa for yeah. sure. Man, this black squirrel's still chilling over here. <laughs> like, he was laying on that tree, man. I know it. I know it, man. He actually blends in real good on that hickory. It's there, pretty dark. Yeah, he does. I was, uh, yeah. That's yeah. the mount right there. That's the mounting pose. that You want him, You want to get him mounted in that pose. Do it, man. Shoot him right now. I'm thinking about Better it. Better use a fill point. That way you don't tear him up too much. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, I've got a, uh, uh, I shot a black squirrel when I was in high school yeah, and I was going to get him out and put him in the freezer and never had time to, or never had the money to do it. And was just kind of hoping my dad would do it and he didn't. So <laughs> <laughs> they threw him away sometime, I'm sure yeah. when I was in high school, but yep. yeah, it's funny. It's unfortunate. Uh, but the black squirrel thing would be cool. I just kind of don't want to do it at my house. You know what I mean? I hear you. You want to preserve the black squirrel, right? Yeah, you keep yeah. them around for I generations like, to see. That's right. I like seeing them. So. Yeah. Anyway, uh, guys, don't forget about the giveaway that we're doing. It's uh, Just go, go to iTunes slash Apple Podcasts and give us a review, and you're in the running. Or a good review, right? A five-star yeah. Well, no, I'm just talking about one I mean, stars. you could leave less stars. Um, you may or may not be included in the giveaway. Who yeah. Knows? We're, <laughs> you, you can take that risk if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's <laughs> all the risk that you can take. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I, we're, trying to, we're trying to beat the heat, and once we get, I guess, a few more weeks uh, from now, we're going to be pretty much kicked into high gear with hunting and everything. Man, so. I'd like to be there now, but it's just too hot to go do it. I know, man. So. I mean, it would be nice to be in the mountains, but... Uh, I don't know. I've been we've been shooting a lot in the mornings and stuff like that. It's it's uh, we're finding a way to like enjoy the outdoors with mm-hmm. uh, without burning up too much. But the humidity yeah. has really been the killer lately. So hopefully that will go away. Maybe we can uh, get through this summer without too many days in triple digits. And uh, I hope you guys can as well. I know if you're north of us right now, it's probably decent weather. But uh, anywhere down here in the south, you're probably melting right now. So <laughs> I feel for you guys. And I hope you guys have a good rest of your summer. And remember, this is your element. Living it.